and welcome to the pre-show. We are here to break down T1 up against Hummelife Esports for our second match of the playoffs round two. I am Valdez. With me is Huni and Ox today. How are you guys doing today? Really good. We've already had such a good start to playoffs with some bangers coming out already. And I feel like today on paper was going to be the biggest banger of the early rounds. So I'm hyped for it. Yeah, on the paper. And also did that yesterday. It was like, you know, it was no one was kind of expecting it. And it's become a banger. And today we're expecting it. So it's going to be even more banger. It, it has to be. If it's the other way around, and it's <laughs> I'm so sad. Well, uh, I did cast the two three twos. And I wasn't casting when it was a 3-0. So hopefully that trend doesn't continue. I was casting when it was a 3-0, though. So maybe I was the problem. Uh, I guess Ox was the problem. Let's take a look at the bracket here and just show off what we have been talking about for playoffs so far. Obviously Obviously, the 3 0 was the Hamalife Esports versus Quantum Freaks. That one was certainly a bit one sided, as Hamalife is quite the strong team at the moment. Yeah, uh, and I do think the KTD plus one was an upset. Obviously, people did have a premonition it could go the other way, but still didn't expect D plus to come out with a win. And then, even though Gen G did win that series, a lot of the predictions were 3 0s or even 3 1 throwing a bone at D plus. That was a close, hard fought series. So, even though the result is expected, the manner in which it played out, definitely not. And I feel like, you know, three series so far. Well, he had two bangers. Yeah, I mean, before this turn, like a playoff, like we were actually expecting on the upper bracket, it would be like just 3-0, no matter what. That's what our expectation. But I think already we we are kind of noob already. So let's see what's going, what's going to happen today. Yeah, in general, we are kind of noob. That is for sure. Uh, we need to talk about T1 versus Hamalife Esports. For some reason, when these two teams do go head to head, it is always a close match. And uh, so far, we have had some interesting plays from them in the regular season. But let's take a look at the upset history as well, because in the playoffs, we have had some upsets. Of course, we call an upset any time when a lower-seeded team does win against a higher-seeded team. Yeah, the big one is like uh, KT against T1 when there's a big gap in the standings. But obviously, that was when Fake was out for a while, so the standings of T1 didn't represent it. Something to note, is this purely when we've had double a limb, which hasn't been for that long. So actually, quite a lot of upsets considering the short period we've had the double elimination format. Uh, it kind of feels like, you know, even if the regular season definitely looks like it's cemented one way, it's not always guaranteed when we get to that uh, playoff bracket. Yeah, it translates, it's like, it's really, doesn't really matter about the actual, the regular season. It's a regular season, it's just regular seasons. And it's actually the, the where the battle starts, it's, it's a playoff and it's a BO5. So I think today's the BO5 as well. So let's see. Best fives are always interesting. I mean, we saw even yesterday, it did go five games and every single game, there's a new iteration in the draft. There's a new iteration in the way they play the game as well. And there has been some interesting gameplay already between T1 and Hamalife Esports. We can take a look at some of the highlights from their matchup in the regular season, starting off from match 20. Yeah, so this was the first time they matched up against each other. Uh, and at this point, T1 just completely Annihilated. Hunter Life Esports didn't look particularly close. And at this point of the season, I think a lot of people were looking at T1 to be the team to challenge Gen G. Yeah, I mean, also the HLE wasn't really looking strong, I would say. Like, end of the towards the end of the season, it was like more so we kind of see like a HLE, like it was like more teamed up. Like, it was like we could actually see more as a team F4. And it wasn't like, and also the T1 was just going pretty good. And then, like, it just like end of the season, like, it's, it was kind of. It goes backward, like they kind of like individually was kind of losing sometimes. And back, back in the day, the T1 just dominating. Yeah, and I think particularly the meta was very different there. We saw Zeka playing a lot of Corky, not to too much yeah. success. You know, a lot of the mm. Zeka, the Keka Corky memes coming out at that time, some inaccuracies with the Rocket. And I feel like T1, not only was the laning in the bot lane and the top lane really exceptional, Faker was on such an absolute tear at the time, still is to be honest. And I just feel like the team team fighting was kind of what we saw from them at Worlds. And then we go to the most recent series where a lot of people were thinking T1 would have the edge. And Peanut had such a fantastic series coming out with this Poppy pick in game one, which had so much value. I mean, it's just Peanut on Poppy and just like also playmaking, like the, starting from actually all the of the, the games, the phase, which is like from the jungle mid, I, I think the meta shift is so hard that it becomes like even more important. I mean, obviously the mid jungle has like been important forever since the League of Legends release. But the thing is like these days, it's like actually there's so many champions that you can actually make the play. Like obviously we see right now, it's like Ant, we see Annie, we see like Talia, this kind of type of the, Stuff or like it's really important to pair with the sync, the synergize really well with the jungle and just like be able to play more wide as a map. And that's that's how you get advantage right now. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, we've seen obviously Zekka have some issues. I think if you compare the mid jungles, for me, Ona was having some issues in this series, and it really felt like Zekka had kind of rectified his. So even though Fake has been having such a good split, it felt like the overall mid jungle of Final Life Esports had the edge, and particularly picks like the Ari coming in were just so high value for Zekka. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that was like Zekka's big glow up in that series. Also, uh, Peanut was kind of insane, just kind of a gap in the jungle. So that's going to be interesting going into this best of five to see where owner's head is at on this one. We can take a look at the head to head between these two teams. It's always close. You know, before we had Genji DK, it was T1 Hummel Life Esports. Even when Hummel Life Esports was like a sixth place team, they always seem to find a win here and there. And you can see that here, the match score, the game score exactly even. Yes, today today we're going to be a uh, decider to see Sue, who has the edge, at least for the rest of the playoffs. They may end up matching against each other with a double limb, but it's always nice when you see teams have that close match record and it has been a fight when they've matched up against each other. I mean, I feel like HLE always is somehow trying to make the way that against T1 look really interesting as well. And I mean, there, I mean, there's the peanut too. The jungle, they, he always get the buff against T1 especially. He always gets the buff, so it does feel like there are a bunch of things kind of leading into Hama Life Esports having a very good chance against T1 this time around. In terms of name value, certainly T1 is up there, but I think this is going to be a very close series. We can take a look at the points of the match just to break this down a little bit further as T1, they are the top dogs of spring in general over the course of, you know, many, many years. They have won more springs than any other team in the LCK. This time around, the top dog, a dog of spring, of course, is Gen G, but T1 looking for another title, potentially. And I think with how things kicked off, you know, everyone was looking at kind of the whole season to be sold, right? It was Gen G, T1 on top. It was like, okay, these two are going to go to MSI. And I feel like the glow up from Home Life Esports has really challenged that T1, after winning Worlds and keeping the roster together, no doubt they want to make it to MSI and look for a chance to claim that title. Yeah, I mean, especially after the you know, after the yesterday happened, the, as we see the results, it's like it's not, oh, I guess it's not really anymore. The Gen is number one and there's a tier two, there's a tier three. It's just like, as soon as they hit the playoff, like there's no tier list anymore. It's just like, unless you actually open the box, you're not going to know what's inside there. Uh, I will be uh, very happy to see what does happen today as all LCK second Faker versus all LCK third Zekka. Kind of difficult to be first when Chovy is on the rip, but these two guys certainly are fantastic in their own right and they are the core of their teams. Yeah, I think Faker has, since last Worlds, I think prior to that for the last couple of years, when T1 played, it, you know, Fake was more like the glue that kind of put the team together. We saw them struggle without him, but I think Worlds onwards, his individual performance has just been so fantastic. It's continued this season. He's looked very independently strong, and it's been such a driving force for the success of T1. I think Zek, on the other hand, it's been very inconsistent. We've seen him struggle when he's off his, his signature picks. Things like the Akali and Yone still have a 100% win rate. But we have seen him start to play better on these majors. Things like Talia have started to bring a lot of success for the team. Yeah, I mean, right now is it actually leading towards more like making champion, but still, like we've seen some, sometimes there's a quirky as well, like and obviously the Zekas can easily pull out like he's the po uh, Poké Connor pick or he's a special champion, and right now it's like obviously the Azir and Orion are still like really valuable, and it's like the other champ like right now the, as you kind of mentioned is like Ari, we've seen so many Ari variables like actually working really really well, and all these champions like both mid laner can easily play really well and. It's just gotta be less, like, I think it's really, it's about the key that, well, like, who actually prioritizes, like, which one more. I also just love whenever Zach is on these playmakers, like the Yone, like the Azir, he has such a good eye for the angles in team fights. Do have to talk about the support matchup, Karia and Delight up there in terms of the votes in the All Pro. These two supports are insane. Karia more so known for his eclectic picks in the support role, the lane dominance he shows alongside of Gumi Yusi, whereas Delight very well known alongside of Viper for their team fight play as we're getting some highlights here of Karia who did pick up the support Callista or was he the AD carry we still don't know. Yeah he's had so many monstrous performances on these carry picks where he's been able to dominate lane and be such a relevant force in team fights and I feel like this is the angle that I would expect them to have in this series. I think if you go to team fights and you're even in gold against Viper Delight I would give the edge to them. I think they've been so phenomenal in those fights but Carrier, you know, playing things like the Tom Kench when he's been given the gold paired with a center, he's able to do so much more than other players have. Yeah, and in Dilla, the other hand, is like actually just the, he dominated an old team fight with Engage, like actually playing, like we've seen a lot of the, a lot of time he playing with Rakan and these days, it was like Rel. And I mean, it's just like the also in lane phases, like you could kind of get behind, but 
Delight is one of the support that he actually doesn't really get behind. And also, he does have a pocket, pocket pick, and he proved that it actually working on the stage. That's the most important thing, and which is like he can actually pull out any single time. This is the BO5. If something goes wrong, he'll just kind of put. He's gonna just put the the special one. Yeah, and I, and I think it's gonna be really important how the bot lane plays out because we've seen T1 be so effective at defeating weaker teams with the bot lane dominance. But you know their most recent series against Gen G and against Honor Life Esports, they weren't able to crush the bot lane nearly as much, and it felt like as a result the opponents just managed to kind of scale to be more relevant in the team fights. We see from the champion pools, Kerry has brought out so many picks, so many of them have uh, a lot of power in the laning phase, a lot of ability to dominate things like the Nico, the Ash, the Huey, the Callista have had a lot of power there, the Rumble as well. Delight's champion pool has been more standard, but it's also like even though these a lot of the picks on Delight's side, like the Rakan, the Rel, are picks that Kerry can play, they very much lent towards him playing those more carry-oriented picks, you know, and Delight has been leading on those team fighters. I mean, personally, I, I really like the Rumble. Like, I re would really love to see from the carry as well. But really? also, I mean, I just like, I don't think there's any counter as well if you're playing really well. But I'm really excited to see like what Delight actually has a respawn because in this playoff, we've seen more. We have seen more. We've also seen a lot of, you know, Lucian Nami and a bunch of Zeri and some of the past best of fives that we've had already in the playoffs. So hopefully we get some interesting picks for this matchup specifically as the bot champion pool for 80 carries as well. Gumiusi playing more stuff. Viper always known as kind of the standard guy, the late game carry, the hyper carry, and he's done that all season. Yeah, I think the crit buffs definitely, I would say, would have helped Viper more. You know, things like the Zeri, things even like the Aphelios and maybe the Jinx, I think he can be really good on. Not that Gumiusi can't play them, but we have seen a shift and also the ban priority. A lot of bans were in the first three were typically 80 carries, things like Varus Callista. In the playoffs so far, we've seen a bit of a move away from those. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a certain player who is close to 5,000 assists as well. Faker getting pretty close. He has a chance to make it, and uh, we'll see if he does get it today. If it does go five games, definitely could happen. But let's take a look at the coach pre-interview before this matchup as well. Hana생명전을졌었기때문에다시한번이제프로에서만난다면꼭목소리를하고싶었는데오늘그날이온것같습니다하나생명이라하면은항상이제좀체금얘기가많이나오는팀인데선수들과코치진이어하나생명팀에
내 미친놈 같아요! <웃음> 저희가 임로를 하면 그거를 쏙쏙 수행하나요? 베이커의 한방! 베이커! 베이커스가! 또 너야! 와, 와, 이런 구도 전 세계에서 제일 잘하긴 하거든요, T1이! 진짜 최고네요! 우리가 아는 T1의 강한 어떤 이미지라고 할까요? 전차가 진영 자체를 그냥 박살을 내고 있어요! 하나 생명을 정말 이번 시즌 어디까지 갈지 모릅니다! 제발! 딜라이트가 날아다니는데요, 당장? 나이다 아니, 하나 생명 오렌지 전차 허리 돌리기 뭔가요? 공룡하고 싸우는 거거든요? 전체랑 싸우는 거거든요? 예! 인간이 젠티 따와! 2024 LCK Playoffs. It is round two. It is the second match of round two. And I'm Atlas, and I'm joined by Wolf. We're here to bring you this banger match. Hopefully, I'm not the problem, because they uh, mentioned it on the space earlier on that uh, Valdez is the guy that brings the five-game series, and I'm not. Is it me? I don't think it's you, but we have not really had playoffs be majority close series, minority with the one-sided series. We're pretty unique this season in that regard, and I think going into this one, before we had those matchups, you know, the last few days where we didn't see the KT uh, collapse, the D-plus yeah. upset, the near upset yesterday, people are thinking this one also, which was our most close match in terms of predictions before we even started playoffs, will actually go the distance as well. Well, let's hope that it does. Let's have a look at some of the team stats here and really get our eyes around what is going on. As you can see, in the regular season, things looking pretty good for T1. That's quite a few firsts. Yeah. Now, taking a look at Hanma Life Esports, you'll notice they dropped in the early game. That's because they were actually behind in the first two games quite significantly against the Kwangdong Freaks, but were able to push it through the mid game. Notice a huge jump up. This is from round one, of course, on the right side. A huge jump up from deep, cold difference at 14 to 20. In those six minutes in both games, they smashed Kwangdong's mid game team fighting. Now, in terms of how these teams match up, T1 has been a stronger early game team than Hanwha Life as well. 
T1 will be a bigger challenge for them when we get to those early game breakpoints. They, they are not going to drop the ball in mid-game team fights like Kwangdong did, so Hanwha Life will have to have a much tighter early game if they want to take this series. Yeah, T1 certainly did spend a lot of time just kind of rolling over their opposition uh, during the regular season. I think you guys can remember seeing quite a few of the pretty impressive games. But let's have a look at some of the predictions here. There could be some surprises, I reckon, as we can see. Half and half, basically. Uh, in fact, a little bit on Hanwha Life Esports' side for the, uh, the Korean side. And for us, a very similar thing as we're a little bit uh, more T1 biased, I guess. So all in all, actually 100% even. Yeah, that's wild. And Nutty. you can see uh, only Chronicler and myself expecting this to not go to five, uh, as everyone else has it as a 3-2 scoreline one way or the other. And for me, if, if, I, if it was going to go to five, I would give the edge to T1. I think they have more depth in yeah. their roster. I think they have more depth in terms of drafting. I think Hanwha Life do need to close this one out in four or less if they are going to win this series. Players like Zekka do not have the wide champion pool that Faker has. We've seen Doran also potentially not be able to have the same long-term like longevity, resilience in the top lane as well, can be emotionally impacted. Unlike Zeus, who I think has really overcome that throughout the last you know year or so of his career. So I really do think that if it goes super long, I would switch my prediction to T1. But I think Hanwha Life, and especially Peanut right now, is where I've got my edge. Yeah, no, I would agree. I actually think because you selected 3-1, it sort of has to be on the Hanwha Life Esports side. Whereas I wrote down 3-2, and I'm like, well, I guess it has to be T1, because in a game five, you just have to give them that edge. We'll have to see what is actually going to happen, though, because I think so much of this is so difficult to predict. But what isn't difficult to predict is the fact that these players are going to walk out into Lowell Park here. So starting off with Zayas, the monster of the top lane, a man who made it very, very difficult uh, to select our All-Pro uh, first team, to be perfectly honest. This guy has been so incredibly good, yeah. even if he wasn't necessarily first place in the LCK. And despite not having the greatest champion pool, it doesn't matter. If you could just pick Aatrox every game and dominate lane and never pull any resources from owner and he could focus bottom side, that is what a team like T1 needs. And I think, yeah, smaller champion pool this season doesn't mean it's not big, but he got it done, and he was so consistent all season long. He absolutely was. And on the other side of the rift, facing off against Zayas, is going to be Doran. And this guy has in the past just had a little bit of a thing. You know, he's just been able to take down Zayas. And it's it's inquantifiable. It's not something that we really understand, but it's happened, Wolf. Yeah. And therefore, it has to, like, Everyone, Factor in, right? Everybody remembers the Gragas uh, games he played on Genji last year's spring. He's been spamming Gragas in solo queue. We saw Gragas yesterday. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, I do think that maybe there's an angle here for Doran. I do not want people to be surprised if he does neutralize Zayas quite well in the lane. As now, Owner walking out. And Owner, I think, has been similar to some of the years in the past. A player who hasn't been as flashy as some of our other top jungle players. He's overshadowed by Canyon. I think not by the season, but by that last regular season match. Overshadowed by Peanut a little bit as well coming into this. I think he has a lot to prove. He's a very strong jungler player. Has a very similar champion pool to Peanut as well. He's got some pocket picks like the Nocturne they like to pull out with the Nico. And I think he needs to show up big if T1 are going to pick up the W. No, I would agree. I actually think that he's the first to get a lot of criticism as well uh, from T1 fans and not T1 fans alike. So we'll have to see how he is going to prepare for this one and what he has up his sleeve up against this man right here. And you already mentioned it. I think that Peanut has been absolutely incredible this season. He has been absolutely amazing. A big reason as to why Alma Life Esports do have the same scoreline moving out of the regular season as T1. Why we're talking about a three-team region rather than a two-team region. Yeah. Well, he has been the foil to Owner. You know, Owner has been often called the hand guy. Peanut has been called the brain guy. And even though mostly that rivalry was on his time in Genji, now that he's moved to Hanwha, it feels very similar going into this best of five. Very much looking forward to seeing how the jungle matchup is going to go. To be perfectly honest, every single lane, every single matchup is just fire. This is obviously another one. Our minds go back to 2022 between these two mid laners, but 2023 was Faker's year and 2024 might be the same as well. The absolute god of the mid lane, the undisputed GOAT of League of Legends. We'll see whether Faker can do it again. 
And we will see. I think he has a strong, strong advantage in this lane. I think might be the strongest lane advantage that T1 have just because of the nature of Faker's insanely wide champion Ocean. And the man who will walk out to face him today, our third pro mid from Honda Life Esports, a world champion himself. It's Zeka. He is the man who I think really solidified his champion pool. He's a master of those melee champions. He loves to play the Yone. He loves to play the Akali. But he has improved his Azir. He's improved his Talia. Does it stand up to Faker in terms of map you know, presence? Does it stand up to Faker in terms of the impact he makes leading into team fights? No. But when he's on his best, I think he absolutely can match Faker. You think about picks like the Corky that Faker has been undefeated on for so long that Zekka's performances on haven't been that great. And I think that does hinder Hanwha Life a lot in draft. I would say so. Um, looking forward to seeing how the draft is going to go for that. But let's have a look towards the bottom side of the map, uh, the map and namely Gumiyushi, who has some at some points this season been overshadowed by his support. It's been a little bit unfortunate, but the man has still been himself. He's still been incredibly consistent there towards the bottom side. And he's got a tough task ahead of him here today because I think that he's facing off against who, uh, a, a bottom lane that could arguably be argued as the best in the LCK. Yeah. They've been playing through so much through bottom lane and strong pushing lanes. You know, if it's not Senna, uh, coming through, it has been a pushing lane for Guma most of the time. And Viper on the other side here, another world champion. We have so many world champions coming oh, yeah. into this uh, series here. Is a player who has played both sides of the coin. He'll play your Kalista, he'll play your Varus lane, but he'll also play the Zeri that Guma has played once this season. And he has played way more Viper. Definitely, I think, the one who gets a bigger benefit out of these crit items yeah. and the late game. He is the late game powerhouse that Hanwha Life relies on so much. And he's been playing a lot of Zeri and Solo Q, but he's also been playing so many Jinx games. You mentioned the crit buffs and things like that. I feel like he really has uh, taken a bit of a bite out of that. And we'll see whether that is going to be reflected in the draft. And speaking of things in the draft, I don't think we can predict anything that this guy's about to do. Carrier, an absolute monster. The man who is demanding 10 kills on his Callista support at the very end of the game. Um, someone who... We just cannot predict. We just don't know what he's going to play, and it makes him so dangerous. One of the most popular players to ever play the game. He has just such a massive champion pool, as you mentioned. And he is the lane guy. He is the one who wins and dominates lanes. They play through the lane. He sets that up with Guma. It's owner and faker diving bottom side and getting massive advantages. And that is where his strength is. And his opposition on the other side here in Delight who did end up not getting second, you know, which was a big shock to us on the global side here in terms of all pro, is the engage guy for team fights. He is the yeah. team fight master. He is the master of roaming. He will set you up on fights. His laning phase isn't as strong as Karia's, arguably, and Hanwha Life don't always play through bottom side as heavily. But when it comes to team fights, this guy is second to almost no one. Yeah, absolutely. I think they're very lucky to have both Peanut and Delight on the same team. It's kind of unfair for Hanwha Life Esports because they have just huge brains when it comes to starting these fights the right way. It's why their team fighting is so incredibly dangerous. We'll just have to see whether it can stand up to the map play, to the coordination and control that T1 can demonstrate, and especially in best of fives. This is the real danger. It's the fact that this is the team that ran all the way through the LPL on their way to their World uh, Championship victory last year. You cannot count them out when it comes to going the distance in these series. And I think even if they lose the first two games, you can't really lose too much heart that they won't just be able to reverse sweep their way back into the series because this is a team that does tend to download their opposition. We have seen the, the duopoly, the top two teams, be T1, be Genji for so long. It's always felt inevitable. It's always felt like those are the two we're going to see. And this season, for a majority of it, those were the top two. Hanwha Life have the opportunity to change that narrative tonight <laughs> and advance to the winner final. As Zeka versus Faker here, looking at the stats, obviously some of these stats in round one and a 3-0 are going to be a little bit padded. They're going to look a little bit strong here. But you look at the champion pools, 
for these two. The standout picks, obviously, the Orianna and the Corky that Faker is undefeated on. There's a few for Zeka that he hasn't played since the first few weeks of the season, like the Akali. Uh, but he, he does have a champion pool that you know is his. But like I said before, improvements have been made in terms of the Talia, right? We've seen yeah. massive improvements in terms of the Azir picks that are so meta right now, so relevant. And, you know, picks like the Ari that have come up here towards the end that Zekka is incredibly good at. So there's a lot to consider here. Even if Baker's champion pool is wider, doesn't mean that you want to face off against one of these strong picks for Zekka. No, I would agree. I actually think that there is so much that we're going to learn even from the first draft, right? Like Doran practicing the Gragas. Who's going to get the Rek'Sai? Things like this. And where is Zekka's champion pool going to be sitting at? Because you saw that in the playoffs, he had over a thousand DPM. Like that is absolutely nutty. The amount of damage he was able to get done obviously was a little bit inflated by his champion picks, namely things like the Corky. But we do know that I think you know, Zekka is one of these players that is able to play in the clutch extraordinarily well. And we'll just have to see which version of Doran we're going to get, um, because he can be incredibly clutch. He can also be the other side of that coin. coin. And Peanut is a very similar player as well. I think Viper and Delight are the only players on Humble Life Esports that we're like, yeah, they're going to be good. That's, uh, that's, that's a given. Yeah. I mean, since Hanwha Life decided they were going to start spending the cash uh, last year, they, yeah. they, they've had two insanely competitive rosters, right? 2022, they went budget. 2021, they were kind of middle of the pack, right? But this year, they are finding the success they could not find last year. This roster gelled together. It came together at the end. And this is one of the best runs potentially Hanwha Life as an org will ever get to make it to that coveted grand finals. It starts here with the draft. Absolutely. See exactly how it is going to go already. The Maokai taken away from Peanut. I believe uh, last count was 10 and 0. 11 and 0 now. 11 and 0. There you go. Uh, the Ash um, banned away against Carrier. An understandable one there. And of course, an obvious flex because Ash Rumble has been a bit of a thing as well. Carrier, of course, debuting it in the support role here in the LCK after. Um, taking some notes from good old life over in the LPL, of course, formerly on Harmo Life Esports as well, which is pretty cool. cool. They're going to take away the Kench here. The Senna is still available if Guma wants to play it. Uh -huh. They could run the Nautilus with that, since that's also open. It would make a Zeri pick pretty weak. I don't think you want to run Zeri into Senna. I think it's a Viper Varus angle if that is pushed through. There's three bands towards Peanut, and it will Whoa. be the Twisted Fate here. That is crazy. Just to start things off. I mean, Senna just, Nautilus is available, Wolf. And it's making Hanwha Life Esports make the decision. Now, if they end up picking the Senna Nautilus here, there's a few picks they could face. Obviously, the Lucian Nami could be the Varus pick. And I think that's a pretty easy call. It's Delight. Yeah. I mean, it's Delight on Nautilus, so... And it's Viper on Senna. There's not much else you need to say when you lock those picks uh -huh, in. Okay. And they think they're going to outrange it in the early game with the Jinx Thresh. And this is the Guma late game crit pick. It's this in the Aphelios, if you're playing against Viper, that you absolutely can match him with. And Karia's iconic Thresh, we haven't really seen it too much in recent times, but it has come back in a big way here with Jinx. Yeah, and uh, Delight was the one that actually uh, picked up the Thresh first off here. Carrier hasn't tried his hand at it uh, after the Thresh was a little bit buffed back towards relevance. It's something that we have seen uh, players utilize very, very well when there are the less mobile picks, such as the Jinx, towards that bottom side. I do think it's just a gigantic gamble, though. This is an extraordinarily explosive draft from T1 to leave open the Senna Nautilus in the very first game. And this is one of those things that T1 does often like to do. They take all of their risks at the beginning yeah. of the series. I, I think that's a wise choice, too, when you have the depth that T1 has. As Talia will be taken away from Faker here. Jace is gone. The Rek'Sai pick still available. Obviously, it can be tough in the early levels to face off against the Twisted Fate, but you get any money, and the Twisted Fate just doesn't hurt you anymore. And we could see them try to control that top side of the map, play the safe Azir lane, and then try to you know pilot Peanut towards the bottom side to make sure this Senna lane doesn't end up having any problems, doesn't give too much plate gold over. The Lee Sin that made it this deep into the draft, I think definitely deserves a look here. Yep. Steering owner has been so fantastic on it. They don't have the poppy this time around. Aatrox, another pick that we could see T1 ban, has historically been very good with this Senna. But Aatrox is up, Rek'Sai is up. We'll see what Doran wants to play. Me just save that pick for counter yeah. here in R5. 
Could be one of those options. They might be flexing the Twisted Fate, it could I be. guess, but it's probably not likely. We did see the Rek'Sai do relatively well into it, though. Um, Peanut probably wants to lock away his pick, trying to deny something from owner at the same time. Sejuani, Xin Zhao, lots of things still up and available, and it looks like it will be the spear wheel wielder himself uh, in the jungle for Peanut. Does feel very strong into a Twisted Fate composition as well as a Jinx composition, having that Crescent Guard to make sure you can't be blown up and then the Jinx gets excited. Very frustrating to play into this beefy jungle that's going to do a ton of damage as well. Now, this was the X Factor. Oh, yeah. The Corky to come through, they can go just hyper scaling with this. They already have a ton of control topside, assuming things don't go wrong here for Zayas on this Twisted Fate. The big question now on everyone's mind is what is going to be that jungle pick here for Owner? Yeah, plenty of things still up and available, but it doesn't feel like a very good Sejuani angle. There's not even a support that does yeah. LA damage, so that uh, permafrost not really going to be all that uh, useful. His rel has been fantastic this True. season, and it looks like that's what they're going to go with here. Doesn't feel amazing with this this composition, but can be great for a package. The Rek side not really a shocker, and you know, we had our eyes on that one this entire time here in draft. It is going to be left through, and Doran will pilot her here into the Twisted Fate. The early game here for T1 can be quite tricky to play out. I think if the Jinx falls behind at any point, you just feel like you're infinitely scaling here with the Sana. You have the Azir that's going to do a lot of damage early. And if this comp falls behind, the Rel doesn't set up for much but package here in terms of team fight combos, because there isn't a follow-up, you know, swath of AoE that's going to come through from a top layer. If you had the Rel with the Cassante, for example, you'd feel a little bit better about how that Magnet Storm engage can look. But there is a lot of ways, there are a lot of ways for T1 to control those early team fights. The Rel isn't nerfed on this patch, that's coming on 14.7, so she can clear jungle very quickly, can contest objectives very quickly, and all T1 need to do is make sure this Jinx doesn't fall behind. The Twisted Fate can really help with that. And early objective control can stack dragons against the Senna composition and force Hanwha Life to take fights before they're ready. Well, we'll just have to see how it is going to work out because T1 also have a little bit of a gap when it comes to the early stages of the game. Jinx and Corky obviously not going to be doing very much of anything very early on, but the package can certainly help for third Drake, things like this, to really start to fight back. And I think the Twisted Fate that we saw lose really hard into Rek'Sai earlier on in the week See whether the it piloted by Zayas is going to be a different story. So many questions asked. Now to get them answered, let's hop onto the rift. All right, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Onto the rift for playoffs round two, our second match. We'll see who's going to be able to take it here in game number one. T1 threw down the gauntlet by leaving open the center Nautilus. Um, I do have a fun fact because you don't necessarily associate Viper with center play, right? He's a bit of a Zeri guy, very good at the creative carries, things like this, with a bit more presence in lane, presence in team fights. Um, Viper has a 46 KDA, 100% win rate on center. Yeah, <laughs> he's pretty good at it. It's not bad. Um, he's pretty good at anything that goes late, even if it's not Maybe fancy, even if it's just a little bit more finesse, uh, as the center often does end up being. Well, we'll take a look at some of these champion stats here for T1, but I can tell you this is the fifth game for Zayas on the Twisted Fate. He is 4-0 and zero. leading into this fifth game. It's now his third most played behind the Aatrox and the Cassante. And, you know, you look at some of these other picks here. Peanut hasn't played as much Jin Zhao as, as a lot of his other you know, really strong picks. And Doran obviously played the Rek'Sai. We weren't really impressed with it against the Kwangdong Freaks, but that was his first games that he did play, of course, yeah. with this champion. And... You know, just one lane and then didn't do a whole lot, but it didn't matter. Uh, <laughs> and I think that he will have to do a little bit more than that this game around if he wants to set up for the Senna. Becomes a very difficult target to kill later on. Baker, 5-0. and zero. Probably get to set on exactly what his uh, win streak is because it is very long at this yep. point. I always lose count. And on the other side of things, we mentioned already that uh, the Senna Nautilus has been something that uh, Hama Life Esports have found a fair bit of success on. Doran with that victory on the Rek'Sai, but like you mentioned, it's not something that we're necessarily saying was extremely devastating uh, or anything like that. It felt like Dudu did manage to handle it relatively well. Uh, Swift going to connect here on to Delight. Bit of a snare coming in though, and Viper and Delight not going to be too worried about how things are going here. Just going to get pushed in slightly earlier. 
Here's the Senna Nautilus huh. win streak. 12 and 3 total, 10 in a row, including some teams down here, Kwangdong Freaks, T1. Uh, sorry, not T1, uh, Fear X. Um, T1 would not be surprising to have on that list, but uh, some of the other teams is oh. not. Yeah, Faker taking a fair bit of damage here. When becomes Lightning is going to connect, but uh, Faker still able to uh, just Valkyrie his way out, and Zekka's health bar does not really help him out too much here. 8 to 3 is going to be. The win rate for Corky mm -hmm. into Azir. Corky Azir has been a tale as old as time. There 22. is that graphic you were talking about. 22 in a row as Ona comes down, gets the flash out from Zekka, and he'll immediately go home. Zekka doesn't have a dash available there. We'll have to flash. Feels really amazing as Ona to be able to get that away early and now to come over here, start putting the pressure onto Peanut. Early on, obviously, the Rek'Sai can't win the matchup into Twisted Fate, so... Ooh, Ona able to steal that one away from Peanut as well. Massive yeah, start. Vision. Yeah, he is really just putting the pressure on the Peanut here, making sure that Zayas can continue to, to get pressure topside. They're winning, obviously, the push in bottom lane. And you know, they have tons of control now. They got the flash out of Zekka's. Meanwhile, yeah, playback onto Viper. He's taking a lot of damage. Lantern going to be taken, and that's going to spell the flash out from Viper. Does manage to snare Carrier, but the hook is going to connect. Delight is able to buffer the dredge line. That is able to get him out of range. So nicely played here by T1, putting the pressure on real heavily on this bottom side. Yeah, everywhere, really. I mean, Karia allowing them to have that agency bottom side, top side, the shadow coming through there from owner. The only way this Rek'Sai starts to win super early is if Peanut comes over there and ZS overextends, but he just isn't. Was shadowed there again by owner coming over there, stealing those camps away, getting the flash out of Zekka. His impact in this early game has been so high. And now, obviously, the, the Corky doesn't have to deal with any sort of flash engage here from Zekka or anything like that. It's very comfortably just going to sit back and farm. Faker did pick up the tier, and he's sitting pretty in lane. Yeah, just kind of chilling at the moment as Delight is hanging around here towards this bottom side, waiting for the wave to push in. You saw a Viper. He's making his way back, but no cleanse, no flash. Possible visit towards this bottom side for the Rel, if Ona would like to, as he does make his way out of base. As Yeah, Doran. Just uh, trying to survive as best he can against the shove power of Zeus on this uh, Twisted Fate. And it's working. You know, you can just go underground and then BK uh, as we uh, figured out. Yeah, and, uh, going through that Fury quite a lot. Just trying to, you know, put the Fury on cooldown, basically, as you mentioned, just constantly force him to heal up. Doran will have to be the first one to back here. Feels great as Zeus should be able to get his destiny up and can take a luxury back whenever he wants. Yep. And, I mean, the, the winning here that T1 is doing early is kind of what I expected here, considering the Twisted Fate lane, obviously the fact that Senna is going to outrange, uh, or rather, uh, Jinx is going to outrange uh, the early Senna lane. to put that poke onto the Nautilus. The Thresh has a lot of power in that matchup, too. And as long as Karia plays it well, which, you know, surprise, surprise, yeah. he's Karia, uh, the early game feels good here for T1. Then you start to stack up packages for those, you know, second, third Drake fights like you were talking about. Things do look very nice here in this early game for T1. Already picking up a thousand gold the lead here with zero kills just from laning alone. And this is what you want to see if you're a T1 fan. Absolutely. First dragon going to be a mountain. We'll see who's able to get over there. I think the dragon stacking is going to be something very important. I think if T1 manages to get a few of the early ones, it's going to be so difficult for Harmalite Esports. Like you were talking about, I think Hanwa probably wanting to get down there and start stacking these before they have to worry about packages. And as we say that, Peanut, Viper, and Delight will start this one off. Yeah, it looked like maybe Owner wanted to try to make something happen here onto Doran, and they decided they were not going to go for Dragon. The back timers of both Faker and the bottom lane just really indicate that they had no interest of contesting this first one here. It's a really awkward time all around. Faker not having teleport, of course, as say it should be fine. It's like, yeah, yeah good luck. Gold, uh, Doran just kind of uh, swimming around. Gold card is going to connect, and that's going to deny any sort of harassment. As Peanut, bit of a drive-by uh, fadeaway smite there as the dragon does go down. Next one's going to be a chemtech. And so Aux is um, is paying attention today. It's really He's good. here. He did the pre-show. Yeah, thank goodness, because yesterday it was a disaster. We had three yeah. chemtech souls. Ugh. That's like... Valis and I did the math on that in Challengers once. It's a real statistical anomaly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, uh, it certainly felt like that. Did make Game Five feel really cool though when we got an Inferno. Yeah, that was like, very. Whoa, relative, relevant dragons, crazy. Yeah, Game Four was an ocean, if I'm not mistaken, as yeah. well. Right? Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, so so far, uh, you know, as we slow this down here. 
Dragon went over without a hitch. Chem Chemtech is going to be the second one here, so not going to be the most impactful, but Hanwha do want to stack that up. As Doran is starting to, you know, be a little bit more of a threat here to Zayas because he does have those Merc Treads, so we'll be able to get back into the action uh, after Gold Cards very easily. Yep. And after he does end up picking up some of those tank items, obviously this is going to be when Zayas can't really hurt him at all. Yeah, but he want to feel him pretty good. I think you want like a, an item and a half or something like that uh, for Doran, and then he's just going to be out scot-free. But of course, you're never really going to be much of a damage threat, and he really wants to be getting on top of Faker and Gomushi and just disrupting as much as possible in these fights. Yeah, is Gold Card going to connect onto the Twisted Fate? As we check out this bottom side, Viper going to land a bit of a snare onto Carrier. This Piercing Darkness starting to hurt a little bit, as we do see now that Peanut was waiting, thinking about some sort of opportunity, but not going to quite get in there. As Ona sweeping things out, and Doran might be his target for Shattering Strike, not going to land, and therefore the Burrow is going to be enough to get out. Very close call there for Doran. May have had to flash otherwise. With the Rel having level 6, you hit that uh, Shattering Strike, then the Gold Card comes through, then the Magnet Storm comes through, and you are not going to be that tanky with sitting on just uh, the Merc Tread, so... You, know, you can heal your way out of a lot of things, but that one I don't think he would have been very happy with, as owners just continue to put the pressure on here, and as Rel, you know, on this patch still, you can just contest objectives like this. Apina has no idea. Yeah, Viper's moving up. Carrier in the area as well. Owner, I think, still unseen as Peanut will now walk into the brush and figure it out. Peanut does manage to get the smite, which is pretty impressive against Darrell. And so, going to be able to get out of there relatively happily. But full information to T1 with the fact that Viper is towards his top side of the map and Peanut is shadowing. It means that Zayas not going to push his luck here towards the top side of the map and we'll have some equalization still. Really? Go first blood. Yeah, and really cool play there from Caria. You know, oftentimes supports do struggle to get advantages against the, the Nautilus, you know, that sits on bottom side with teleport. So, trying to match the center roam here and allowing owner to continue that pressure top side. Yeah, he didn't end up with a successful takeaway there of the red buff, but it was a good try. And he's just shadowed there by Caria, who has the lantern for him. So, really no risk to owner whatsoever. And if Faker tries to rotate up there, you know, maybe there's a play that could be made if that can make some mistakes. So, just constantly putting the pressure on. Speaking of which, uh, Peanut is now going to find Ona. Gets a full combo here as Ona is just trying to get himself out. Emperor's Divide, and they push the Rel away. The Crashdown is going to come through as Shattering Strike is a fair bit of value, but it's not going to get out of the Void Rush. That is First Blood going over to the Rek'Sai. side. Yeah, it looks like he's just scared that perhaps a Flash would come out there, so just uses the ultimate to guarantee the kill. And this is a problem for Zayas. Doran getting a little bit accelerated here. Isn't going to be game-breaking or anything like that, but... Owner ultimately decides not to flash there. Will be the end of his life. And that is, uh, you know, a good choice. I think all things gets here. Probably dies anyways there. And we'll now have it for the engage. Is Faker yeah. out of his depth here a little bit holding this package? Yeah, he's able to uh, play with relative um, abandon when it comes to uh, danger, just because that package does afford you so much safety. And so able to walk on in there. Still, uh, Zeka being able to grab his first assist of the game I think we know Zeka not necessarily as a laning Azir, but more as a team fighting Azir, one able to find some of these angles for the Emperor's Divides, and we'll see whether that is going to be the same thing as Doran is in trouble. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's see whether he can get himself out of this one. Teleport is going to come on through as he's trying his best. Dives on top of Carrier here, is now Faker taking a lot of damage from this turret. Super Mega Death Rocket connects onto Zeka, but I think that Hummel Life Esports have kept themselves alive there towards the top side. See whether Gamushi can do the same in the bottom lane, and it looks like he will be able to, stifling the pressure on both sides. Yeah, the dive a little bit mishandled there by T1, but also they see the teleport coming through from Zeka. They don't want to hard force it, and the, the aggro juggle was pretty decent. As we're going to go back to this play here onto Owner, just sticks around a little bit too long. Faker is backing as well, so nothing he can do. Was just desperately trying to get to his blast cone. Knows he's out of flash range to flash to the cone and decides not to use it, which I think is wise, but probably shouldn't have been pushing that far up. And the defense there of the dive top side was pretty successful. Zeka did not have his ult. He does now. Faker, no package available here as uh, Peanut does slow Faker down. Ona is going to be here. Flash out from uh, Faker, but there's the audacious charge from Peanut. They get the knockoff, and Faker is going to be taken down, and Emperor's Divide immediately follows. Ona this time is going to be able to flash and will take the lantern away to safety, but still, two kills for Hanwha Life Esports. Really massive start here for Hanwha Life, and one of those kills going over to Viper here. This is not what you want to see as a T1 fan. Doran just uh, trying to do what he can. 
The uh, ghost is going to be used here from Zayas, who's just throwing, throwing so many cards at this Rek'Sai. He will eventually just be able to uh, hop in a tunnel and get himself out. Harmalife will be able to take the prize of a Drake, unless Ona is able to do something about it. They do have a bit flash. of information as he gets on over there. It's going to be the steal, but it might be a sacrifice of his life as well. Magnus Storm comes in and he takes the Lantern! And Kerry is going to save his jungler. And T1 are just so good at this, man. You know if you see the, the Observer's pan over towards Owner on the wall, he's got his Hex Flash, Carrier's got Lantern, they have Super Mega Death Rocket. They're going to try every way they can to prevent the Dragon stack, and it is successful this time around. Now, Ocean Soul being the soul here, you know, arguably a much stronger soul here for Hano Life, considering they have this farming Nautilus and the Rek'Sai. But at least it's not going to be the next Dragon Threatened Soul Point. Good play there from T1 to deny the Dragon. The gold lead is still theirs right now. Still holding half a thousand as the advantage. But Kerry's starting to get a little bit closer to online here. The Senna getting stronger. Obviously, the Azir now having Nasher's Tooth. The early game has felt pretty good for Hanwha Life, turning things around. As this is just a lot of greed here on a Faker. Has Valkyrie, but as you mentioned, no package. The escape range here, not large enough. And then I appreciate Peanut also following for the flash after the sun comes through from Owner, making sure he can get that knock up there onto Faker. Zekka tries to get Owner here, but will get his flash only. But a good attempt nonetheless. Karia is here to cover once again. Karia has been everywhere this game. Speaking okay. of that, you'll see this play here. Goes for the steal. He's got oh, the lantern yeah, yeah. to get out. Pings it. Yeah. He's like, over here, please. <laughs> <laughs> Success. Really nicely played there by uh, T1. And Carrier, always a joy to watch uh, on this Thresh. You remember the Q buffs on Thresh where Carrier landed like 11 yeah. deaths in one team <laughs> that fight? That was so silly. It was very that. silly. Thankfully, uh, we don't quite have death sense uh, at that low of a cooldown anymore. Would be a little bit broken. Super Mega Death Rocket is going to spot Doran out as he is fighting with Shelly right now. A bit of a void battle. Viper decides to avoid it. He's like, Doran, you can take it. You can go underground. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not taking this damage. You can. Um, Viper is getting scary, though. We can see that uh, he is you know, behind in gold and stuff like that. But Delight actually keeping up. So as far as the 2v2 is concerned, pretty even. Uh, most of the money is, in fact, on Zeus. Uh, as we can see, he does have his Static Shiv very close to the Rapid Fire Cannon, I would assume, and is extraordinarily far ahead of basically everyone, um, but notably Doran. Yeah. As, uh, you know, passive, etc. He is going to get pushed away from his turret here now, and uh, Doran and Peanut will be able to put a decent amount of damage onto this. Only have one Void Grub, so... Not going to be pushing this one down very quickly. Ezeka does have Ult Flash. Yeah, he does. And he also has Viper coming down here towards his bottom side. As Emperor's Divide is going to be avoided. Ona was tanking up the turret for such a long time, though. And is just going to fall down. Viper just great positioning here. Gumiushi Carrier just a little bit late to the party. Yeah, uh, Owner a bit of a, a miss on this one. Well, so Mega Death Rock, can he get Flash there? That is a lot of respect given. And now Destiny coming on through. Zayas will find the gold card, and that is a very comfortable kill. Snare should be able to keep Viper safe, but that is still so much damage done, and the acceleration of the Twisted Fate is well and truly continued. Yeah, now they're going to try to counter drop this Rift Herald here in mid, and they should be able to get a decent amount of damage on this turret. See how long they can stick around. It is a Nautilus and a Shin Zhao here trying to push this down, but with the minions, they should should be able to get it very low. And T1 are just saying, well, we have a lot, much longer push. We have five Void Grubs. Yeah, and that is going to be a death sentence on to uh, Doran as well, who is going to get flayed back. Viper will find his way back here, and they should be able to keep this turret alive, but it is not exactly very healthy. No, definitely not. Neither the mid turret that does survive here or that inner there on the bottom side. All right, Peanut taking a lot of damage here from Faker, who is... Almost towards his items. Uh, Peanut deciding to go in is very aggressive, as now they're just looking to try and lock down this turret. They will be able to do so. Zeka able to uh, get a few autos in there. That will be the outer in mid lane taken down. A lot and of map control and power with that Drake falling. You uh, mentioned that turret falling. Yeah, and you mentioned the Twisted Fate as well, how how much gold he has. He's leading the farm right now. He's 40 CS up on door, and he did pick up that turret, of course, bottom side, as well as that additional kill onto Zeka. So. He is pretty big, but how well will he utilize gold in the late game? Twisted Fate often a, a champion that, you know, does end up doing a decent amount of damage when you get to the late game, especially if your team is crushing it. And we see full build Twisted Fates. We've seen it from Zayas multiple oh, yeah. times where he actually ends up just crushing through even a Cassante's health bar. But the, on the other side, it's Viper who's getting to be quite large here for Hanwha Life. And 
question becomes now which one is going to have a larger impact as we push through this game. I think a lot of that will depend on how many of these Ocean Drakes Hanalife Life can stack up here against the poke. Uh, Ona is going to come on over and take away the shellfish. Peanut's, Peanut's like, that's a relic. I, I yeah, give up. he's like, no, I'm just <laughs> not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to waste my time. As gold is entirely even. Five seconds until our first Ocean Drake of the game. As Doran teleporting to the mid lane. They are not wanting to give this one up without a fight. Gold card locked here by Zaius. Going to throw it at a Drake for the moment. Now Carrier moving on in. Hook going to connect onto Doran. Not exactly an optimal target, but he's going to be denied. The Barrow does have to blast cone to get himself out of the way here. Let's see whether Owner is just going to be able to utilize the rel to lock this one down. It is going to be secured, but can they win the team fight? Hook going to connect onto Peanut as Faker delivers a package to the back line. Viper shields himself up, though, has to flash over the package to avoid the damage. Hook is going to be there under Peanut, though, and he should go down. Empress Divide lands on almost everyone, and there goes the Jinx, but Viper falls immediately afterwards, and now the damage is just seconds. They are zones in on it, and that will be the lockdown of the Emperor. And there is the damage gone. No one else able to offer anything back. And Delight, yeah, he's tanky. He lasts a little bit longer, but he will still be going down. And T1 wiped the fight. Yeah, T1 wiped the fight. Take a pretty significant gold lead here. And we'll end up getting control of mid lane as well. They could probably decide to, with five Void Grubs here, just push this turret down with this cannon wave. Owner and Faker can make very quick work of it. The moment that Doran ends up using his burrow, doesn't have anything, gets gold carded here, and you're contesting Ocean Rift here with this brush, I think you should probably just walk away as Hunter Life here, because you're playing the smite fight into the rel, and then Peanut just walks up anyways here, isn't able to set up for a Crescent Guard, even though Faker's package is very lackluster, and he kind of puts himself out of the fight, it's still a jinx once she gets excited in this fight. You know, you're like, okay, do we keep pushing this? She gets taken down, and then you have no more damage here. Zekka's already used his Emperor's Divide, and yes, he does have his, his second item nearly complete here. I don't think it's actually quite finished just yet, but right. he's just isolated here. Doran is just a meat shield delight the same. And if you end up losing the Senna, and even if the Senna is isolated on top side this early in the game, you're not going to win those longer fights. And it felt like Hanwha Life were just like, well, I guess if we win the 50-50, it'll still be worth, right? And it wasn't. And now you can see the goal lead is massively in favor of T1. Owner was never going to lose that smite fight. And a uh, huge whiff, I think, here on Hanwha Life on this fight. Yeah, it's not really what you're looking for, looking to see as Faker able to get a couple of kills on this Corky so far as well. Still not really with that first item completion. So I'm, I'm a bit scared because already he's doing so much damage. Does have the transformation on the Mirror Mana. But it doesn't, like, the news doesn't get better for Hanwha Life Esports, right? Like, Corky, once you hit those couple of item spikes, you're absolutely devastating. We saw already, you know, Gumiushi was taken down immediately in that fight, but T1 still had the damage to keep on going because Zaius exists, right? They've got triple damage threat on the side of T1. And so as soon as you do get those first couple of kills, it is so difficult to continue fighting because you just don't have the same level of damage. Yes, you've got protection, but not so much the damage. And Hanwha Life Esports just needs to be more coordinated in these fights if they want to get this one done. Now we've seen a lot of, you know, more defensive Azir played with Senna uh, out of some of our top teams. You know, we saw that from Faker. Uh, we saw that from Jovi, actually, even Showmaker um, playing the Grasp Azir a little bit more defensively to keep the, in this case, Viper alive, keep the Senna alive in these longer fights and itemize for that. But it's just going to be looking for engage as the way Zekka is playing this. And that's not surprising given Zekka's play style in general. But I think they're going to have to slow this game down. And that's frustrating into a Corky. But if they just keep trying to match T1 in these early objective fights here, I mean, we're I say early, it's 20 minutes, they're going to be in trouble. Uh, Zayas just going to very comfortably take the inner turret. And Gates is way out. Uh, tunnel over for Doran, but he's only able to pick up these minions, not able to save his structure. And so 3,000 gold is the resulting lead for T1. They have a Drake advantage as well. Things for this Corky Jinx composition are looking absolutely fantastic at this stage of the game. They're yeah, looking for a pick here with this teleport from Delight. Yeah, but it's package available as uh, Carrier and Ona are in the area, so therefore should be absolutely fine. Uh, they're going to clear this vision, but starting the Baron, I mean, T1 definitely okay. will just contest here. This is a pretty interesting call from HLE, considering this is a Senna early this on. Fate can't actually make his way up here, so I'm like Esports are just saying, we have five, you have four, and at the moment it is three. Hook going to connect as Owner's Magnus Storm is fantastic. He's lasting for so incredibly long and gets his way out as well. But still, Doran able to lock that one down. Zayus is now in the front line. This is dangerous, but the Jinx is now going to get excited. That is the second kill as the front line has been wiped out. 
And now Doran, the last one remaining with any uh, kind of health bar, and Humble Life Esports gonna have to get out of there. On one hand, I can appreciate the call here from Humble Life Esports. It's decisive. You know the Twisted Fate doesn't have teleport. He doesn't have destiny because he just used it to get out of the bottom lane. But you're also dealing with T1's composition that turns on engages so well. They have Rel, they have Thresh, they have a Jinx. If they get even one single pick, you are gonna lose that longer fight every time. And it was a lot of resources used on the owner whose counter magnet storm is so good. And this is why Rel is just so strong on this meta because she can contest smites, she can walk forward. Because if you hook onto this Rel, it's super easy for the magnet storm re-engage to come through. As you see here, Santa Ultimate does a lot of work here for the side of Honda Life, getting them that additional heal to the shields. But as soon as there's a kill here, you know this one is done. So there is no way to compete with Gumiusi excited at this point. Even with Zekka still having his ultimate, he is just going to be outranged by this Jinx, and she can play very carefully around this Thresh. And if you go in as Zekka in that moment, you're probably just going to get hooked by Karia. Yeah, not a whole lot they can do about this is, you can see Harmonife Esports were thinking about this Drake. They managed to start it up, but they will give that one away as Package now collected for Faker. Does have Teleport available as well, but won't need it. Has that extra movement speed, and I think Harmonife Esports just realizing that it's probably not worth it to fight over a, uh, a third Ocean Drake if there is Faker with a package right there. He has Spear of Sojourn completed as well. Uh, Corky is starting to come. Very, very frightening. And it's, you know, a call maybe here to try to trade objectives, but it's not decisive enough, I think, for Hanwha to actually start this up. And, you know, it's frustrating to see if you're, I think if you're a Hanwha fan, they didn't make this decision on the last dragon that was so critical. Make it here, but there's no cross map and T1 are just one step closer to that critical soul and you got nothing in return. Yeah. Control Ward does go down. They do at least have vision control of the Baron. But uh, that's, that's that's where the good news sort of ends at this point. And we saw how their last Baron start went. I think yeah. it's going to be even tougher this time around, even with that vision control, if they want to try to threaten it. But that may be their MO here. Yeah, Package has now dissipated. And Hamalife Esports is going to take that as the go marker. Zero vision available, but of course, Destiny is. And so that means infinite vision, if they would like to press the button. They are going to press it now. They're going to see that the Baron is down to 50%. Of course, if Ona gets into the pit, it's not even a 50-50 as they take down the tunnel. There's the hook. They're going to go for the re-engage. They find the knockoff, but he's just so incredibly tanky. Kumiyushi going to get jumped on here as Doran going to try to take him down, and they are going to be able to do so. There is two kills to start this one off, and finally, Humble Esports have found a team fight. They'll get the knockoff. Empress Divide onto both damage dealers. Still, it's a double kill for Faker, but it shouldn't be a one fight here for T1 as Doran, Zekka, and Peanut are just going to try and take him down. There's the knockup. Wind becomes lightning indeed, and there is the takedown onto the Corky. Finally, and I'm alive. Esports win a fight. They give it to Zekka as well. That's massive. It's his third kill of the game. He's getting closer to that third item, but that was such a coordinated fight there for Honda Life Esports. Caria is over here trying to uh, <laughs> just be annoying. Just be annoying, as you say. I don't oh. think it's really going to necessarily mean anything. We'll get a teleport. Yeah, teleport from Faker in 20 seconds time, though. So I think this Baron is just gone. Nothing that Carrier can do about it other than watch. He will be uh, spared, at least at this moment. The Baron is going to be taken down. So Hummer Life Esports, they do manage to get their prize. And the gold that we were talking about now just jumps up 1,500 and, and back to even. Just like last fight, Owner is able to stand between T1 and the Baron and then can turn with Magnet Storm. Senna Ultimate's going to come through, but then watch the swap here onto Guma as the Nautilus ult comes down. And then Doran securing that kill after the Lancer, just tracking that so incredibly well. If he doesn't get that kill, then I think this fight absolutely could have gone T1's way. Zekka holding his Emperor's Divide until the end to get these secure kills on the attempted exits from T1. And Faker will be given over to Zekka as well. Hanwha Life Esports, this is the kind of fight they were looking for. Much better coordination from them the second time around will lead to the Baron. Yeah, and uh, you saw at the end there, um, Carrier tried to give the, the Lantern to Faker, but unfortunately he went over the wall and was unable to actually pick that one up. So unable to be spared still. Let's see how this Rebel Baron power play does go for Hama Life Esports. 9-9 nine to nine is the kill score. Very even everywhere, all across the map. But they are one turret down. This bottom outer still yet to be taken for Hama Life Esports. So some standing gold for them to take down as Doran getting to work on this top side. Yeah, and this should be able to get them a little bit of prio leading into the next dragon fight as well. They could take much more comfortably than the last two. 
Peanut will just shadow this push here towards the bottom side, potentially even be able to take home more. Yeah. Zizek are down here. When it becomes lightning onto Carrier, he's going to break his shield. As Faker with a full clip of rockets. They should be able to defend at least over here. Doran just getting to work everywhere else, trying to keep things shoved in as best he can. So, so far, it is one turret that they've picked up. Good hook is going to connect that onto Peanut, who does have to Crescent Guard, actually. To and avoid he the damage. Ops into that. Not 100% sure he had to do it, but just felt like he didn't have enough information there. And, you know, you're dealing with Jinx Rocket, etc. You just don't want to mess around with that. He decides to, to pop it just to be safe. And the problem with, with sieging as Hanwha Life is your siege comp is decent, but you don't have the ability to hard engage on the T1's comp because their turn is so amazing. Plus, you're dealing with turrets, you're dealing with insane Jinx range. So this Baron play here is going to be about 2k. It looks like nothing too crazy. Yeah, Doran does have his uh, tunnel, but isn't actually going to utilize it as the turret will be taken down. So against the flow, with 30 seconds left on this Baron, it's still... Zayas that's able to lock down a turret for T1. So even on the turret trade, uh, and not exactly the greatest of uh, Rebel Baron power plays, we can see it is just basically the beginning goal of the Baron. Nothing else. No extra map control picked up for Hanwha here. And is it going to be a dragon? That is the question. Are they going to be able to deny the soul from this comp? Because I think Ocean Soul does work out very well if you are one of these uh, corky competitions yeah. because you can just sit and poke for a really long time. Stuff like that is certainly good. The timing of the back here for Peanut works out. His Flash and his ultimate back online here does end up picking up the Randuin's third here. So Peanut is on three items now. Heading into this next fight, going to be very difficult to kill. Where's the pack? Back in, not there. Destiny yeah. has been popped here. So Hanwha, their positioning 100% known. And there is the Drake. They're going to start the fight as well as Owner is going to have to crash his way down and out of there. Super Mega Deathrocket this time not going to work out as the tunnel out from Doran. He is still at full health. He can play that front line if they would like him to. And he's just tunneling around. Does manage to eat a gold card for that one. Is now T1 with positional advantage in mid lane. We're going to try and put pressure on this inner turret. The rest of Palmer Life Esports trying to rotate their way around. This comp is pretty fragile here from T1. Besides owner, they have to be so careful about staying in this mid lane and pushing any further. Is if they get split apart, it is going to be a disaster. Delight did not ult in that last fight. Zekka still has Emperor's Divide. There's so many different ways T1 could get caught. If they want to try to get cute here, they need to be very careful and cautious. Ooh, Zap not going to connect onto Peanut. Neither does the hook. As when becomes Lightning, it gets yes. itself out of the way. Gold card at the ready. But he's going to flash on top of Viper. He does get into the mist. And he's able to get himself out. Immediate cleanse. That is a summoner spell in trade for an auto attack with a card on top. So yeah. you'd probably say that it's worth the T1. Well, uh, still the flash was utilized by Zayas. Yeah, that's the, that's the other issue. I mean, I, I love this play if Viper doesn't have cleanse. But he did. So, you know, does get a small win there. And if perhaps they were able to lead into another CC there, it would have been absolutely worth it if they end up killing Viper. But they're unsuccessful. You could see in that last fight on the Dragon as well that as Delight becomes more tanky, he can just kind of walk towards owner and say, yeah, normally if I hook you, you know, you, you Magnet Storm and then the team focuses me down, but I'm so big now that it's very difficult for you to do that. And the rest of the team could just play around me. The center's range now, getting closer to that of Jinxes and having the ability to actually slow fight these with a three item, three and a half item now with the arm guard picked up. Azir is really comfortable for Honda Life Esports. Seems like the tides have turned a little bit here when Faker doesn't have package. Oh, Peanut needed to have uh, swept that ward that Doran was standing on as uh, Delight. Not going to quite find that still. Going to be the snare connecting on to Ona. 40 seconds on the Baron. That is going to be the next thing to watch out for here in this game. T1 currently with a lot of vision control, at least towards this river opening. Tremor Sense getting so much value oh, here. Yeah. It's always knowing where T1 are rotating. You can see that showcased here by our observers, those little rings you see on the ground. Doran knows where they're kiting back. Are they lurking there? Are they looking for a counter engage? This Rek'Sai is just going to give so much additional information to the side of Honorable Life Esports as they kind of juggle for neutral here and start stealing away some of these camps, stealing away deep vision. Now T1 have grouped on this spawning Baron. 10 seconds to go. They have amazing turn. Faker is going to be able to pick up package here for this next fight. He's prepped his big rocket as well. This could be a game deciding fight. Yeah, T1 already starting this one up as Delight in position. Flame Chompers go down. Hook going to go wide there. 
as Zekka now finally going to join the fight. The hook is going to connect. That's on the flashless Twisted Fate as well. Still, he's able to kite this one out. The flash forward from Peanut and Doran's able to lock that one down. But now the package is absolutely gigantic. Still, Doran just shrugs it off. They are able to take down Peanut, but Emperor's Divide connects. And that is the wipeout for Humble Life. They are looking to try and end this game. 9,600 in damage for, for Faker on the Corky. The package is big, but it's not big enough. And it looks like it might be the end of his winning streak here on said champion as Hanwha Live with a huge team fight win here. And Doran so consistently guaranteeing these kills on Guma, even with the Lanterns, even when the Jinx is over the wall. With that turn from Faker, it is not enough. Oh my god, the intensity of this game, but still. I'm alive now, knocking on the front door of T1. These death timers are not exactly the longest, but the Nexus turrets are going down. Still, Owner standing his ground, trying to take control. They'll take both Nexus turrets, but they're not able to end the game. And now, yes. Destiny has been propped. Teleport to come in here as Delight is in a lot of trouble at this point. He is going to be sacrificed. And now Faker's teleported over. Is this the count to win now for T1 as the gold card? He's going to connect. Doran is not able to get out of this one. And that's Faker locking that one down. Remember, guys, the Baron is still up. Yeah, the and Baron T1 is up. can just walk on over. And also, so is the Ocean Soul here for T1. They might be able to just be able to get both out of Hanwha Life's overextension. A misread, miscalculation on ending the game. Vision here to see Zekka trying to threaten that mid push. The Nexus is open and naked, but it doesn't matter. You only have an Azir to worry about here. They tracked him well, and they will be able to turn the Baron around, as this fight is absolutely wild. But again, T1 have such fantastic turn, and when they have the cross here from Faker, when Hanwha Life go in, everything is spent on the Zayas, and so Faker's like, this is going to be one of the greatest packages in pro play of all time. As Hanwha Life Esports are super priced into this, look at the layering of damage here, and the Doran over the wall to kill Guma is so massive there without that play. I think T1 again have a much better chance with all that damage coming through, but then they do ultimately win it and fail to push. And that is Baron plus Ocean Soul over to T1, and now they're suddenly back in the driver's seat. Yeah, um, they do have an exposed Nexus, which is a little scary, a little frightening, you could say. I'm like Esports now going to push down with this super minion towards that uh, exposed inhibitor, but there are still inner turrets in top and bot lane. And with the Baron, I don't think that Hamalife Life Esports are going get, to be getting anywhere near that uh, Nexus at any point in time. Control Ward put down as well just to make sure there aren't any cheeky wards for the teleport. Still, Zekka and Doran don't have theirs up and available. As with five members of Hamalife Life Esports here, it is very difficult to defend. And now Magnus Storm is going to get that engage on through Peanut, taking so much damage now, able to use Owner to try and taxi out, but the double knockoff is fantastic from Doran. They take down the Thresh and the Rel, and now Fumiyushi is exposed. He's going to get snared, and now the game is finally over. Hummel IV Sports, it looked dicey after that push failed, but this time around, the Nexus will go down. And on the red side, Hummel IV Sports will take game one. And Doran's Rek'Sai, we said it didn't really leave a mark in that Kwangung game. You know, we were like, yeah, it was serviceable, he was Rek'Sai, but how much of an impact did he really have? We've definitely seen better. In this game, he did a ton, and after losing lane, after having really no resources given to him in the early game, outside of that one teleport to stop the dock, locking down Guma in those two critical fights, he was huge, and obviously the Tremor Sense providing a ton of information to Hanwha Life the entire time. Viper, we know what he's capable of on the Senna, but I feel like this game wasn't necessarily about that at all. And Faker will take that first loss on Corky. It has been so long since he's taken it out, but Hanwha Life will break the streak. And look at the damage numbers. It doesn't look like the winning team was the winning team as far as this graph is concerned. And you can see that is kind of mirrored in the gold as well. The intensity of this was absolutely ridiculous. And if that's indicative of what we have to expect in this best of five, uh, I'm going to need a backup play-by-play -play or something like that. We're going to go to a short break, then it's going to be the space, and we'll dive into game number two.
이제 나와. 내려가 볼게. 그래 빠져 빠지고. 나좀 세게 할게. 한 빠져. 내려 그리고. 아. 내일부터 한번 끌어도 되나? 아, 그래 내 그래. 나 괜찮아. 좋아 좋아 좋아. 나 내일부터 내 먼저. 징크스 한대 꽂을게. 자 징크스. 야 여기 빠져 빠져. 앞날 빠져 앞날 빠져 앞날 빠져. 징크스 내려줄래? 내가 징크스 볼게 기다려. 아 징크스 뛰었어. 징크스 징크스. 징크스 빠져. 징크스. 그때 내가 볼게. 포르티 높게 끊었어. 포르티 높게. 끊어 끊어 끊어. 나이스. 나이스. 자 스피 잡아. 스피부터 잡을게. 아 개잘했다. 아. 아빠 잘하자. SK 최초의 3,000킬입니다. Faker, what was that? 
이게 지원이라는 이름이군요. 파나 생명이 스포츠입니다. 내가 없는 곳에서 최강을 논하지 말라. 지지율이 많이 올라갈 것으로 예상돼요. Hello and welcome to the space. We are here after game number one, where Hama Life Esports was able to pick up a very nice victory over T1. I'm still Valdez with Huni and Ox. Guys, what do you think about that game one? Pretty close until it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, hopefully an omen for the series because there was definitely a lot of back and forth in that one. Uh, very hard to place, hard to predict, which kind of matched how we felt going into the series. Yeah, I mean, it was like completely different type of the two comp uh, the other compositions is like one they want to play fast and one they want to play really with the control and i think the hle like i think they play really well around like when they, uh, it's like about the distance like keep keeping the distance like when they want to engage just engage right away and try before they get the poke down they just like really it was like decisive like there was a who there was a right side flank or like zinza just going in the same time the basically the follow was re really really great it's uh i think the t1 should have played more about like just wait for the poke and it's just like a round objective i think there's a lot of time that they were kind of late i mean later on the game like they needed more like proactive plan it's just like hle was clearly in the game one i think they were just like had a better just team decision making yeah and i did like seeing the jinx thresh come out because obviously with the cry and buffs jinx was one of the main benefiters and also thresh pairs really well and it's had like a load of buffs I think the thing is, like, the comp for T1 does make sense. Like, you have a lot of range elements, a lot of scaling elements. You have tools like the Thresh to keep space, the TF as well. But I think the problem is, is that Hollow Life Esports comp, and we've seen this time and time again with the Senna Nord, you're just so bulky. You're so tanky. You have this farm Nautilus, the healing and shielding from the Senna. Combine that with the Rek'Sai and the Xin Zhao, those are two picks that do eventually fall off, but they never really got to that point. And all the fights, it's like you just brute force. Everyone just dives into them. It's so hard to kill the Xin Zhao through result. Obviously, he just can't, none of the range champions can deal with him. The Rek'Sai can heal in tunnels, can use his ult to drop aggro. And also because you have like a Jinx, you're kind of waiting for that first reset, but a lot of the fights, it just never really came through. Yeah, it's pretty interesting as well that uh, T1 obviously did go for the TF first pick, and then R5 was Rek'Sai. The fact that it went all the way through and they say, okay, the TF is great into the Rek'Sai, that's fine. But then they get the Rek'Sai, which we saw in this game and many other games, that's kind of just unkillable, and it does a lot as well. So the fact that Hamalife Esports got their hands on that alongside of everything else with the Senna Nod, that was given by T1, was pretty interesting to see. Let's take a look at some of these team fights. We did have one over the Baron here that did go the way of Hamalife Esports. I mean, just like while watching, we watching this highlight, it's just the uh, the consistent, we have to just check the consistent damage, like who's actually most DPS is the, each team that can have it. It's just like, in the, for T1, it's a Zings, and it's a, from the, the HLE, it's about the Azir, and it's like, just look at HLE, the focus, like actually Zings like way better than the, Azir, the T1 just focusing on the Azir does. It's just like, after, the, as soon as like Zings has got so exposed in this team fight, they can't really do any anymore, and it's like the fight is like it's so one-sided. Like sure, the TF could have probably built like more the the consistent damage to build, but it doesn't really matter. And even Quirky is like we know it's like he's not really good at actually killing the tanks. And as soon as like Zinx is will die, the fight is like so one-sided. I think as well you can track a lot of like the healing, like the fact that the Rek'Sai is ending the fight like full HP is just so ridiculous. Like I feel like it's not even the fact that like T1 aren't doing damage; they're doing damage just doesn't stick and those kills aren't coming through, and I think that's really why they struggle to translate. And it can execute your AD carry, which other big tanks, beefy tanks like Udyr, like Cassante, I mean Cassante. Cassante definitely Cassante can. Cassante definitely <laughs> does. Cassante <laughs> definitely can, but I think that Rexa is a bit has a bit more staying power uh, with you know the Spirit Passage. Pretty ridiculous at this point in time. We did have another fight over the Baron that did, uh, did go the way of Hamal AP Sports. This one started up by T1, though. Yeah, and it felt like they kind of had a point where they're like, okay, we're confident, we got good items. But unfortunately, the fight opens with Zayas getting pretty chunked down. He's already on the back foot. And they try and retreat to create space for Faker's package. But I think even though the package value is quite high with the hitting all the front line, I, I think it's just too late, you know? Zayas is dead, Guma is already super low. Yeah, I mean, I think the T1 was like just kind of impatient. It's like they had to wait for the, the Faker to actually just 
from base, he had a pet pick up the package. It was on the way, just walking to the Baron, all the way. He didn't really make it out. And before, and it's just, it was land, got it hooked. And I think the fight is started just too early. Like, as I said, before just, like, get, getting the poke, if the fight is like that much, like once, like before the, the poke, I think if the fight actually started, it, the fight is just gonna be no matter what kind of one sided. Yeah, and it absolutely was. Hamalei Fee Sports with a big showing in this first game. Let's see who does get the big showing in the POG. As we did have a couple of ideas here on the space. Um, but it is going to be Doran, the Rek'Sai. Uh, again, R5 had all the time in the world to pick this up and had a great game on it. I think what stood out to me is the fact that the laning phase didn't go excellent. We've seen Rek'Sai's have good laning phase in the TF before, but usually due to like outside ganks giving you an advantage. But it's a fact that we've often seen Rek'Sai's have a great lane and then not be as relevant in team fights. And Doran had so much presence in every single team fight. He was getting so much value from his ult, from his healing, and doing just a fantastic job. Yeah, I mean, just basically when, when actually Rek'Sai kind of lose the game, it just kind of falls off like later on the game. But this game, it wasn't. It wasn't the cases, and he actually played really well and never get full behind. And I mean, personally, I vote for Zeke because like, it was like, as I said before, it was like basically Zinx against uh, Azir if there was an actual team fight. And I think the the basically the Azir, I think the, I really like the, the position as well. Had a bunch of votes for Delight as well. I think that's fair. Uh, a lot of big game changing hooks. But at the end of the day, as we saw in those highlights, I think Doran was the big one kind of um, doing the, the big plays in the team fights. We did have one guy on media alongside of you, Huni. Anything to say for yourself? You guys can't call me Hunya. <laughs> I'm lost. Yeah. Yeah, I think Delight had a really, really solid engages. And I think we're seeing again why Senna alone is obviously strong, but not that much of a problem. But Senna Nord, we've rarely seen because it's so obnoxious how tanky the Nautilus gets. And he still obviously pro provides a fantastic engage. Yeah, I think it is pretty surprising that that one did go over. T1 is going to choose the blue side once again for game number two. And I would imagine that we're not going to see a similar draft or at least that combo given over once again. But we are done here on the space. Let's go back to the casters for game number two. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for that breakdown. Uh, and uh, thank you for your service, Hunia. Um, I like Meduni. <laughs> Maduni is probably my favorite. Um, I like Madunia. Yeah, Mad <laughs> Mad oh my god. <laughs> Too many layers. Uh, as I think that Orcs has actually trained media quite effectively. Uh, yeah. You saw there that they actually just spread a vote to everyone else who got votes, right? I, I think that it's it's fantastic. Meteor is uh, just hey. new. There's Boxer. Yes, Layers Boxer himself. Yeah, one of the OG SKT players of old. Yeah. Um, you have some experience with Boxer. Oh, yeah. Well. Uh, such a fantastic guy, stand-up uh, dude, and uh, one of the greatest players of all time. Uh, was basically considered the first esports goat. Um, it was still early days, yep. and all time has gotten quite longer since then. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the most creative players is. You mentioned this. You know, Hanwha won on red side. We had all of our wins yesterday on blue. So T1 coming in this one, they will pick blue side again. I think we will see a massive change up in draft year. I do not think they will give the Senna over a second time. But so far, the focus is still on those 11 O's, the 11 O Maokai, the 11 O Oriana here. Taken off and draft looking pretty similar. We'll see if T1 this time wants to play the center themselves. Yeah. Or wow. ban it here in this third slot. And this was all peanut bans last time around. It was Maokai Vi and Poppy. This time it's Maokai Vi and Jinx as, yeah, T1 have decided they're going to first pick center this time around. Uh, the Tom Kench still going to be the ban away. And so what is the pick alongside Nautilus that Harmalife Esports are going to go for after this center is locked in. It was very obvious that that was what was going to happen. But now, is it just going to be, like, Nautilus Zeri? Is that what they're well, planning to play? I don't I don't know whether that's necessarily that great. The Varus has been the go-to here for Viper in situations like this. But, you know, Nautilus plus the, uh, the Varus isn't an amazing combo in terms of what you could do later on. In terms of poking and stuff like that, it's not going to control the lane very well. And we'll pick up the Nautilus as a denial here. Yeah. And now, you know, we've seen Carrier play a ton of different champions here. Whenever a Senna gets locked in, four Zion was buffed. Yeah. Orin is still, you know, decent. Um, we just have no idea. And they might keep that a secret for a very long time. As once again, Zayus 
will look to play around just having Perma Pryo in top with a range advantage. And this is what T1 did. They, before, the old champion was Aatrox. It's like the meme where he's looking towards uh, the hotter new top lane, the, the range champion. He's like, ooh, <laughs> Twisted Fate, though. That seems to have Perma Pryo. I'm going to blind this instead now. And they just allows him to play so much through bottom side here and keep the Senna lane safe. See if it's going to be a carrier pick here or if they're just going to keep that a secret for now. Yeah, I, I do think that it's a bit weird that they uh, didn't decide to lock in something like the, uh, the Rek'Sai because Rek'Sai Sejuani, we've seen, is so devastating. Uh, it's not even going to be the pick. It's the Zeri Nautilus lane that I was talking about earlier on. I'm not a huge fan of it. I think that uh, Zeri is so incredibly strong with Enchanters, but they needed to deny the Nautilus. Yeah. And uh, Viper is really good at Zeri, so I guess uh, I guess that's the angle that they're going to go for. Zeri can be deceptively strong in early to mid-game team fights, especially in the early game Senna uh, timeline. So if Viper just forces fights non-stop and eventually gets a few kills, has his Zeri moment, then I can see this composition really snowballing quite effectively before the late game happens, especially if you're considering the Twisted Fate angle here. Not a very tanky composition for the side of T1. As we will see that Talia denied. Love the Rek'Sai ban this time around. Adaptation yeah. into what was a very successful game there from Doran in our first. Faker's pool getting thinned out a little bit. The Azir is still available. Likely to be the R4 pick here for Zekka is what we'd be assuming. Assuming it's not banned, yeah. Um, I I personally like to see something else just because I feel with Sejuani, you open up so many doors for Zekka's champion pool to really flourish. Um, but we'll just have to see what Hummer Life Esports are going to go for there because they didn't ban away the Azir themselves. They took away the Ornn, of course, one of Carrier's favorites alongside the Senna. I think that Scion is probably the one that is likely to come through in and its place. You have, you know, the Yone pick here for Zekka potentially. You know, they have the Jack. Okay, that's taken away now. You have the Jack's angle as well that Doran couldn't end up playing since T1 didn't pick it away. And, I mean, I feel like if you lock Azir here, it doesn't feel amazing with the Sejuani, but it does, does still feel pretty powerful for those early to mid-game team fights. And then you can still pick something for Doran in the top lane that pairs with this, like the Jax. Yeah. As there's no way for T1 to pick that away anymore. They already locked in the Twisted Fate. They already have the Lee Sin picked up. So there's a lot of different picks that Doran could play with uh, this, this pick. As Faker is just once again going to go back to... Well, I was going to say Corky, but he's going all in on scaling. I feel like this is a huge mistake to play uh, the Cassidy here into this comp. So strong in the mid game. Much rather see a Corky or an Aurelian Soul if you just want to slam down a late game scaling pick. I like this pick a lot more. That is uh, Graves being hovered right now for Carrier. Probably not going to be what is locked in. Uh, Cassante Senna. That is an option. Uh, the Scion is obviously what we were expecting. Um, but Cassante would be an interesting one. Um, still, Scion going to come through, of course, is just a brick wall uh, on that bottom side. Farms incredibly effectively as well in 1v2. That is likely where he is going to be. Can also just, uh, you know, end up doing some cool interactions with the Senna root. Ooh, where you just punt, punt a minion at the Zeri, lock her down. That was the old G2 special, if I remember correctly. Is just, there is the Jax that just, you were talking about. Yeah, just going to be the Jax here for Doran. And, you know, the Jax has been pretty... Decent into Twisted Fate. Obviously, the Twisted Fate outranges you, can you know stun you if you know the uh, you know, follow up is coming through. Like Peanut comes over, but it's really difficult to deal with Counter Strike uh, when ganks do come towards the top side. And Owner will have to play a little bit towards bottom side, I think, uh, in the early stages of this game, just simply because eventually there's going to be all in angles for the Zeri. The Scion pick makes it a little bit tougher, but if you don't end up getting a knock up onto the Zeri, Zeri will just out damage you. And early fights around Drake's become so incredibly hard to pilot here as T1 that I do really like this draft from Hanwa a lot. As once again, you know, the Senna value is so high, but this time they didn't get it with a the Tomcatch, they didn't get it with the Nautilus, they didn't get the Orn. And Scion is kind of fourth best right now, and we knew it was coming, as you mentioned. The Smash and Poby yeah. hanging out here to watch the games. There's my goat right there. <laughs> um, but I, I got to say, I think overall, the, the, the holes in the early game here for Hanwa, or sorry, for T1, I lead in towards Hanwa once again in the second draft. I kind of agree. I do think that Senna is just like really, really strong and giving Carrier more power with all that extra gold on the Scion, even if it is, you know, a step below something like the Nautilus that we have seen find so much success. I think it is still a danger here 
Alma Life Esports have put themselves together a decent comp, but I'm looking at that top side, see whether that Jax can actually find some value against the Twisted Fate. Let's dive under the rift for game two. Uh, T1 fans are extraordinarily loud today. Um, we're not even on their side of Wall Park. I'm normally completely trolled by the fact oh, I'm like, whoa, they're so loud, but that's because we're on their side. No, no, they're on the other side, and it was almost deafening. Well, there's also T1 fans on the Hanwha side, as it turns out. Uh -huh. <laughs> there's no rule where you have to, like, indicate your fandom, and then you can never sit on the other side, but uh, there's just so many T1 fans that that does happen. As uh, Karia is doing the dance here, I don't know what to call that, but it's the correct skin. It is a uh, bit Pacific Rim vibed. Uh, I do like that, as he can become a choo-choo train, and that is the most important thing. Uh, I've never picked any Scion skin that wasn't that one ever. Not I think once. I'm a I'm a big lumberjack fan. Um, do really like the uh, lumberjack skin, but it does it is less cool um, when because you don't turn into a train. Khan picked it like once or twice, I remember. Yeah, he was uh, a on. he was a he was a lumberjack enjoyer. He played a lot of train sound as well, but <laughs> you know, he would occasionally do lumberjack for you. I could yeah. I could feel it was a, definitely a shout out to Atlas <laughs> moment. Thanks, Khan. I appreciate you. Um, Karia did go on sealed spellbook, which is quite common on this pick. So there's some fun stuff you could do with early game control over dragons and stuff like that, where you can try to look for a smite fight into your favor, shore up some of the weaknesses this comp has around objective control early. Yep. Or packages become a big relevant thing that Baker can utilize. As now eight wins for Zeka on this Azir. I think he's really turned around his Azir play since 2022. You know, starting with Worlds. As yeah, Guma all time has never lost a game of Senna, yeah. including internationals. He's doing pretty well. As our carrier is taking a fair bit of damage. Not going to find too much there with the Q as the response, but of course not the end of the world. We've seen a lot of uh, Santa lanes get kind of abused in the early stages, and you just press Q a few times and everything is kind of all right. I mean, T1 was kind of considered the Senna team. Like, they played Senna Wukong at MSI. Yeah. They just do whatever they want with it, but this is definitely going to be a comp that, that can run into issues here. Once again, owner's going to put the pressure on the Peanut here on Red Buff. Yeah, he is uh, going to interrupt the resonating strike quite nicely. There is Peanut, but still going to lose out on this trade pretty hectically. And the red buff going to lose interest. You can see Ona now moving on over. And Peanut will be able to sweep out the fact that uh, the Lee Sin is still in the area, but I don't think Peanut's going to be able to do too much about it. Might need to just move over to the other side of Zekka. Down to 200 health here in the mid lane as well. Not going to be a whole lot of help with this battle in the jungle occurring. Yeah. Delight roaming. Okay, Hook gonna miss onto Faker here, as Delight is just going to protect his Azir. Uh, this is a very large wave. Um, my goodness. Okay, well, owner is uh, up here towards his top side. Peanut gets on in there, just to try and grab some little rocks, but not gonna be able to get too much. And 13 to 17, the so early game advantage there. Quite large for owner. Yeah, so frustrating here for Doran, as Delight looks for another opportunity here. Yeah, another Hook is gonna go wide. Doesn't um, flash for it or anything, but but the early game here for T1, once again, just playing around the fact that Owner is pushing towards red buff. He has the red buff advantage. Tried to look for the three buff take there on the peanut. Comes over and he's like, well, I'm going to slow you. You can't actually win this fight. And even though it's an Azir versus Corky, the prio was Fakers. And Doran is obviously you know, getting pushed in on, on, on the top lane by this Twisted Fate that T1 know exactly how much pressure they can put on with Owner. And both of his early games here, game one to two, has been really fantastic, giving T1 a lot of agency. And you can see already in the gold graph here a significant advantage from his pressure alone with these winning lanes. Just T1 things. Yeah. Uh, Doran going to cancel his back here, as you can see. Manages to get the cannon, as does Zayas, who is thinking about a cheetah recall himself. Doesn't have teleport, of course. And only level 5, so no gating back to lane or anything like that. Peanut will be able to get himself some shellfish here towards the bottom side. And no big advantages, but... Decent amount of gold uh, over to T1 as, uh, you know, TF exists and stuff like that. The gambler are pretty good at making sure that money is in their favor. Yeah, that's a decent amount of that gold lead. A lot of the other parts, you know, just the, the farm advantage that owner has here in the jungle. As a cull was picked up here for Viper while uh, Delight was roaming. So he is going to have a really strong uh, mid-game spike here fairly early. 
And even picking up the Shiv is going to make things a lot more comfortable for him. He can make a larger impact on the map with that before Guma, you know, can really deal with those waves. So Hanwha Life Esports will have a lot of power around that window of time once the call completes here, even if he doesn't have his Zeri moment in terms of kills. Yep. Do like this purchase quite a bit. As Doran went fleet footwork again here on this Jax. Delight is just not, he's a he's playing River Nautilus at this point. Owner gonna start off the bubs. I'm pretty sure Delight knows what's going on. Peanut is going to dive out as the hook comes out of nowhere. Thanks for that one, Jonah Strong, for the jump scare as they do find the permafrost onto Owner. The flashes come forward, and there is first blood going to the Sejuani. The punishment and the long con by Delight. That was really well played. Even though the hook misses, he still has the root. He's still got his passive. And he will still help secure that kill. Goes over to Peanut here. Now Zayas under a little bit of pressure, signed ult. Oh, he's going to get interrupted as well on the Destiny as Doran's going to jump his way out. Teleport going to come on in here as it's Carrier making his way up towards his top side. It means he's not going to be there in the bottom lane to farm things out. Viper getting a bit of respite. And I actually really like that Hamalife are doing this, right? Because Zeri is notably a very good farmer under yeah. the turret, right? Especially when you consider that it's just a Scion that's pushing in. There's not really a strong engage. There's no way, there's a way to push the wave to the turret, but there's no way to then punish Zeri as she sits on the turret. So they're kind of flipping the narrative here in terms of the, you know, big roaming support often being the Senna, so to speak, because she's not farming, trying to get value around the map. It's actually, in this case, the Nautilus on the farming Zeri side that's actually making those big plays proactively here as Delight purchases a control ward, allows himself to stay hidden here. He knows it guaranteed. Goes over to this brush here. And even though Delight's hook misses, they end up following up, obviously, and Delight can end up getting the root here. Good flash there from owner. The timing, fantastic. Will force out a follow-up flash there from Delight. But uh, he does ultimately still go down. Really yeah. big play here from Hano Life to bring the gold back even. Still, no big advantages. Of course, uh, Twist of Fate just making it really hard to find a gold lead. Still first blood going to Peanut isn't end of the world for T1, and they still have all of those scaling options. I mean, it's it's Senna, Corky, and Siam. All three of these champions scale to infinity. It is just kind of nutty. Corky not so much, but like just gets so incredibly powerful. It kind of feels like that. As Fumiushi coming on over to grab some souls in the mid lane. Peanut just stealing away the Gromp here towards the top side of the map. 50% health. And now Zeus is potentially in trouble. Finds a gold card onto Peanut, who will throw out the ulti and eventually flashes his way out. Still, Owner is able to lock down the kill. Now Doran, he's going to get taken down as well. The gold card is going to connect, and he's not going to be able to get the follow-up. And T1, they punish hard. Doran's typing, got a plate worth uh, in the chat <laughs> oh, right no. now. As that was not it, unfortunately, for Hanwha Life Esports. A huge botch on the dive as the gold card is used on the Sejuani. Smart call there from Zayas. Obviously, the Counter-Strike would have otherwise denied it. And Peanut tanks too much aggro. They know Odner is rotating up. Peanut flashes still, so two flashes down and they fail the play. Zayas ends up being the biggest benefactor. And a very awkward moment here for Hanwipe Esports. One step forward and two steps back. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a worry as Control Ward in the back of the pit here. T1 knows that this Drake has been started up, but it looks like Hamalife Esports will be able to lock this one down. So once again, first Drake going over their way as Doran is here on this top side. Doesn't have his teleport available. The Twist of Fate still on top side of the map as well. As Ona going to safeguard his way in, and he's just going to steal it away. It's highway robbery from this Lee Sin. He's even able to interrupt Peanut, who does get the permafrost. Viper now looking for an opportunity, but the kickback is too good. Empress Divide also fantastic, and the burst fire is there. Carrier going to get taken down into his zombie form, and he's going to find no value. And Wolf, are we certifying it? I'm going to certify it. I've got my stamp out right here and just slamming it down on the table. And this is exactly what I'm talking about with this composition for Hanwha Life. It is so easy for them to win long-term skirmishes into T1's composition because there's no real strong front line. Yeah, you've got a buckler as support Scion, or really farming Scion bottom side, but otherwise, you know, these early fights, the Zeri just has so much mobility as well. Don't make me watch it again. Yeah, oh dear. So Counter-Strike is out here onto the Jax, so that's why Stun's Pino takes an extra turret shot. Their owner is over here for the play. Zayas is like, thank you very much. We'll be able to grab that kill as well. So not even both kills going over to the Lee Sin. As Delight is making things happen here once again. But look at Viper's positioning. 
in this fight. As yeah, you got the dragon, but you priced yourself into this extended fight. And Viper's just sitting here full health going, yeah, okay, you can go on me, you're taking that Q into me, okay. But uh, Senna can't do anything here, and Corky can't do anything either. Whoa. There's a lot of people here in this top lane. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's all right. We're going to see whether Peanut can actually try and get some sort of gank working as uh, in goes Doran, finds a counter strike onto two. Q connect here, but the dredge line, the depth charge, absolutely fantastic here from Delight. Still, there is the package delivered right underneath the turret. No one's gone down just yet, though. Another hook is going to connect as they're trying to juggle, and there is the kill going over to Delight. Zekka's coming up. Yeah, this is starting to get scary. These health bars are relatively low. But Zekka is kind of here by himself. So and he doesn't have ult. Yeah, it's not exactly a, uh, a kill opportunity. As, all right, Control Ward has been put down. And there is the Hex Flash over from Delight. Doesn't quite find the value. Shifting Sands gets Zekka out of dodge. As we're just back to laning. All right. Yep, everybody calm down. Everything's fine. Now, yeah. this is the, the Shiv spike I was talking about with Viper, where Carrier on a uh, Scion, you know, is going to never die, but will never be able to deny Plate Gold over, never going to be able to get back control of this bottom lane, won't be able to control mid lane either when Viper comes over there. So he needs to be able to make a larger impact, or Guma needs to start making larger impacts on his own. Otherwise, this area is just going to naturally scale up through this mid game. The Santa will be stronger later, arguably, depending on the game state. But right now, the Zeri feels like a goddess here across the rift. And the top side play, once again, the package gank. We saw it in game one, failed there. Fails here from some good plays from Delight there. Hanwha Life defend it. And now Faker is packageless. Doesn't get anything out of it. Really unfortunate. Also teleport down now on the Corky. Zeka picks up that early Nasher's Tooth. And Hanwha Life really feeling quite nice with their position here after a few whoopsies in the early game. Yeah, I would say so too. Let's have a look at the replay to this top lane fight as well. Doran starts it off pretty nicely with that Counter-Strike. Yeah, starts off with a nice Counter-Strike. The ult comes through here from Peanut. And Faker does still commit to this play here onto Doran. And even though Delight takes a bunch of package damage here, it's still early. Look at this hook from Delight. Keeps Zayas under the turret for one extra shot, and that is the end of that. Even with those low health bars there, Faker is not going to stick around. Oh. I was thinking maybe there would be some action as Delight and Sejuani up here. I don't know why I decided to say Delight and Sejuani instead of Delight and Peanut, but I did. It was just uh, what I decided to go with. <laughs> as uh, we do have some uh, bubs going down. And we should be able to stick around for a few of them. Void Mites might be available here for T1 in a few moments, but I don't think they're going to try and go for the final one. So Harm Life Esports should be able to get that if they would like it. Peanut is back in base, though, so they'll just leave that one in the pit for the next couple of moments. And should be only three going over to T1. Yeah, this is going to be Viper just coming in here looking all for right. all in. He's just going to ult, and he's going to make sure that uh, Carrier turns into a train, and he is going to get out of there. I feel like that's pretty worth, because without the ultimate from Carrier in this next Drake fight, you know, it's going to be a little bit more awkward for them to fight this one out. As Faker used the package topside there, we'll see what he can purchase on his way back. Didn't end up buying the Hex Drinker this time around, so slowing his build down significantly this time around in this second game. Just finishes Muramana. Frozen Heart is done for Carrier as well, as this fight is really huge for T1 if they could somehow miraculously win it. I just don't know if they even want to opt in. I mean, there's just so many great ways to shut down this early Senna right now on Hanwha Life's side. And I think opting into this and losing another fight to this area is just opting into losing this second game. Yeah, owner is on vision, remember. It's Zekker is just going to deliver him to the rest of Hanwha Life, and Viper is now on a killing spree. It's a disaster for T1. Yeah, that's a third kill for the Zeri, and that's, that means no dragon contest here whatsoever. They can get the Herald in exchange as they do start moving towards this top side. Maybe they want to get something uh, like a Jax as well, as Doran does have Flash. He has his ultimate available to see if they can get him. If he just walks it out, they can get the turret here. Yeah, and uh, Doran's spidey senses were tingling. I just don't know whether it's going to be enough. Zekka's as... TP is coming up in just a second as well. I don't know if they can really stick around and try to force this. Yeah, and in fact, Viper was moving up as well. The ganking Zeri, uh, the most unexpected of gankers as he is now just going to shove this wave towards the turret. This has been, like, the most unfettered Zeri ever. Yeah. Viper, he's just come into teamfights, taken kills. Orcs, pay attention, please. Um, but Viper is just 
kind of had a free laning phase and even found some skirmish kills and taken advantage of those two. And and it's a Azir and it, or it's a Zeri that you're laning into as the Scion, as they are going to try to come over here and contest this Herald now. Hanwha Life, they win this one. It's pretty much lights out. And T1 just walk away. And that is the concern of this accelerated Zeri. And I mentioned this in draft. I feel like the Scion can't really do what a Nautilus can do. Scion is kind of an ult button and a very large Q that if you stand in, you know, he makes an impact in the fight. If you don't, he doesn't do what Anolis does. Anolis has a massive ultimate that's going to hit multiple people. It's targeted. He can Q multiple times in a fight. The Scion is now just sitting on a turret against a Shiv Zeri or a Nasher's Tooth Azir and just getting beaten on. And Karia has made very little impact. Meanwhile, Delight, 100% kill uh, contribution here, 100% uh, participation on this Nautilus. He's everywhere all the time, and Hanwife's early game has just been going swimmingly. Yeah, I feel like Delight has, uh, he, he took the All-Pro vote personally or something like that. He really wants to tell everyone that he is, in fact, still an absolute god on engaged supports, and he is demonstrating that here today this on moment. the Nautilus in back-to-back -back games. And yeah, Zekka just says, no, 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 you're coming over here. Yeah, that was just a really good call with the ward that they had there on the Krugs. A little bit of greed there as owner was hoping his team would maybe rotate over and collapse on a slower neutral fight there with the Corky. And he's just a victim of vision. Yeah. And this is going to be the mid turret going down before the charge even happens. And so now Shelly going to keep that health bar as Doran does have his Counter-Strike. And it's going to be difficult here for uh, owner to find too much. Does just kick him away as Faker trying to convince Peanut that he is not welcome in his jungle. Peanut probably not really going to listen to that one too much as Viper Tank's casual turret shot. Delight now looking to come on over. There are a lot of people towards the top side of the map, as you can see. Zekka has teleport, so if they want to continue to push this, they are going to have to be very cautious of this. He can both get this outer turret bottom side and make an impact here top side. There's that oh, TP. Yeah, and now the flash forward from Delight. He'll find the depth charge onto Gumiyushi, and this center is in a lot of trouble. Zekka going to fly on over, does find the Arise, and then the Sand Soldiers will finish the job. Doran actually getting the kill kind of big here as well that Jax in a side lane is very, very scary. And Viper just back to killing the minions. Viper's been playing this so well. He knows he can rotate between top and mid so easily. He, every single time there's a potential skirmish there, he's like, I'm so ahead of the curve. I'm so fed. I have Runins, you know, at, at 16 and a half minutes. I will go up there and make an impact in this top side fight if you guys want to continue to force the issue. T1 trying to get a cross map there, knowing there's no one who could stop this is your push. They're like, well, we have to get something here, but the turret is even so healthy that you really have to question what's the angle here for, for pushing Guma. It's not like he's getting plate gold or anything here. Zekka had teleport. They should have been able to track that. And T1 falling apart a little bit here on the map. And yeah, the game state is definitely not good for them, but it feels like it's getting worse all the time as the Scion has still been completely invisible this game. Yeah, the Scion and the Senna not really reaching the point where they're able to be that relevant. And with the acceleration from Viper, it is just so incredibly scary. That on top of the fact that it's Viper, right? Like, we just know that this guy is always just going to be good in a team fight. Could we be looking at exactly what I was saying before, where it's T1 falling down 0-2, as this might mean no, as Dawning Shadow is going to fly on over as well. And there goes the Azir. Now, Doran, that is an unfortunate teleport. If ever I've seen one, as Carrier with a celebratory face plant into the wall. Carrier also flashing there. Very strange exchange, as he will be able to get uh, Doran's teleport in his flash as well, but... Okay, Hook is going to connect here as there's the ulti out from Viper. Faker now in a whole lot of trouble as the Piercing Darkness comes in, but the flash forward from Viper says no. And now the Mega Cone from Gumiushi still. Viper able to get these burst fires over, just dashes over the wall. There's the Extendo Beam, a good sidestep from Gumiushi still. That's, uh, that's going to put some fear in him. Yeah, it certainly will. I mean, now he's flashless, so the sidestep was good, but... If you're just watching how these skirmishes play out, every time T1 looks like maybe they got an edge, maybe they got an advantage, you look at the Summoner's, you look across the Rift, and you're like, well, not really. Viper's still the king of Summoner's Rift here in this second game. And Zayas, he ends up getting a big shutdown of gold there on that last play top side, but it doesn't necessarily ultimately matter that much as Doran is still Jacks in the side here. And now that he's shadowed, now that they've pushed the Senna away, he should be able to get this turret as well. We'll put Hanwha two turrets up on T1. A Fed Zeri and Azir getting closer to that Leandri's breakpoint here. 
I mean, this, plays like this, I think, are absolutely necessary. And this is why T1 is such a resilient team, despite deficits like the gold one they're in right now. They can make proactive plays. As Carrier Pale flashes the wall ah, there, yeah. and that's why he ulted like that. And uh, it's a little bit rough as Faker gets caught here as well by Delight, who just feels like he is everywhere, man. It's a global Nautilus. He's just involved in every single fight that T1, or rather the Hunter Life, is opting into. Good sidestep you mentioned from Guma, otherwise this is even worse. Yeah, and I, I was doubting the, the Nautilus uh, Zeri, but the way they played it into the, the center Scion lane was just beautiful, you know? Like, just, just opt in to River Nautilus, you know? Get him around the map, get him involved. And you mentioned already, I mean, he's still sitting at 100% kill participation. This guy is, like you say, he's just everywhere. And and the the skirmish that T1 opted into on that dragon, like you got the dragon steal, be happy with that. I mean, that when we rewind this game, that is what the big story is about. That's when you start to see this map turn, or this gold graph turn red. It's been getting redder since, as Delight was roaming the entire time, but once Viper became online, they just have this kill squad. And it's so difficult to deal with, with this Jax that's also starting to really be a big threat as well. He just runs forward with the, the follow-up stun for anyone that Delight hooks, and then Viper just wipes them off the map. It's a Chemtech soul, so T1 leading the Dragons here doesn't even feel that significant either. No, it's not exactly the greatest. And we almost have Infinity Edge completed for Viper. When that third item is done, this area is going to be so scary. And with Leandri's now complete for Zekka, they can threaten Baron very effectively. Their Baron damage extremely high with the two damage dealers that they have. On top of Jax, who does a decent amount as well. They'll start this one up. It is dangerous. And full vision was given over to T1. Of course, you can still press that destiny button if you would like to. And so there they go. Um, I have already backed away from this one. There is a kick forward. Good Arctic Assault there, but Doran's still going down so incredibly low. Delight also having to flash away. Is there's a flash Empress Divide, but it's whipped entirely from Zekker, and T1 will punish immediately. Now Viper still trying to get damage down, able to buffer that gold card nicely, but now with a man advantage, T1, they might just move over to the Baron themselves. Oh man, Zekka's gonna be feeling that one tomorrow. He better stay <laughs> off the internet for a little while, as that was such a cool idea. But well, the rest of his team was clearly backing out. He goes for it anyways. Now, Hollow Life, they're not just going to go quietly to that good night. They've got to fed Zeri. Oh, yeah. They're going to contest. These extender beams are scary. There is the hook in, but he's not as tanky as he was last game. And Delight will just immediately get punished. Enot has flash. Yeah, they want to try and get on in here. Doran's at full health now as Viper has pressed that ultimate button. This is kind of a Zeri fight, and he's going to take out Zayas first. Into the pit they go, but the Baron is still going to go over to T1. So still their advantage, and Zekka will teleport in, but it's a bit too late. Yeah, I'm, I'm not super happy with the handling there from Hanwha of this scenario because they basically just opted into losing Peanut there. He didn't even commit to flash in. They didn't have enough control to actually look for the contest there. And yes, it's a fed Zeri, but you just don't have vision. You don't have any way of getting into the pit and consistently doing that damage. You don't have any lockdown for anybody. So uh, poor Zekka. As owners up here in the front line, Senna ultimate is pretty high value. The kick actually buys yeah. enough time for them to retreat away. And then it's a really good flash there from owner. And Zekka just completely whiffs and just throws himself into the bin. And then as T1 start to do the Baron, like the angle here is not great. If if Peanut was actually in the pit or had flashed in earlier, maybe he ends up getting the steal and gives his life for it. But it's like he's deciding whether he wants to actually commit to living or whether he wants to commit to the Baron. And he will not flash to the pit, nor will he live. As Viper does end up taking out Zayas, so that's one consolation prize they do end up getting here. But the teleport commitment as well from Zekka, who doesn't have ult, is just a little bit sus. Yeah. Uh, was definitely very well handled by Ona, just over the wall, back and forth, back and forth, making sure that uh, Peanut wasn't able to get anything done. The best way to guarantee that you can take the Baron is by killing the enemy jungler, and that is precisely what he did. And now you can see that gold graph moving back towards Hamalife Esports. IE done for Viper with that fifth kill. It's the Viper story, you know, with this roster always. Yeah. It's going to be me to carry again, isn't it? And we'll see whether he actually can do so, of course. As you mentioned, I mean, the gold... Like, it, it is just base gold from the Baron, once again. I feel like we've just, we're just we having a mirrored game this time around. 44 seconds on this Chemtech Drake. And someone like Esports just trying not to take too much poke damage. There is the back to come through from Gumiyushi. Baker does complete his uh, Maw. Does take a lot of damage from Zekka, but not so much from 
Viper if he does end up getting ulted on. So he has to be really careful about how he wants to use his packages here. And he may just simply opt into the fights they know they have guaranteed Pryo on to avoid getting packaged at whatsoever. Whoa, there's another flash forward here as Empress Divide is going to be used just to get Zayas out of here. The ulti comes through from Viper. He does do a lot of damage, but T1, the Phalanx is being put together. And there goes Zekka once again. Oh, feels like Zekka, that play from earlier on. Kind of got into his head, perhaps, but it was a good pick off from T1 nonetheless. Thorin's going to teleport top here to try to trade turrets as T1 used the last 20 seconds of this Baron. The push mid. Faker is going to come over and try to deal with him in this side, but it is a Jax inside. He's looking for Faker, actually. I don't know yeah. about this. Faker is going to have to flash, but there's a flash through from Doran. Dawning Shadow does come down, but there is another leap strike, and Doran gets himself out. And Okay, Doran. <laughs> I mean, he's, that, uh, he's starting to become scary. Yeah, that was a very scary moment there for Faker, but he also could have just perhaps looked to focus down the turret instead, but it's a trade of flashes you'll take as the Jax has a little bit of inherent mobility versus this Corky, who has his own, but a pretty long cooldown and one that you have to hold when you're holding package. Doran is just constantly putting this pressure on. Keeping it his teleport for this, and I don't feel like it has been a waste necessarily, but he's not getting the value he wanted. As T1 just calmly takes soul point. Warren's gonna get out of here. Is maybe a backstop? <laughs> yeah, Peanut is just being as frustrating as possible and succeeding. These games just don't breathe, do they, Atlas? No, they don't. And <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie, I, just, I, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for this level of intensity. It's neck and neck again. I swear 26 minutes in game one, it was the same thing. Yeah. It was like nine and nine. I remember you calling out the kill yeah. score. And we were like, well, it's anyone's game. Uh, obviously, there are really strong win conditions here for both teams this time around. You know, you have the Corky coming online here. The Senna is stacking up, even though it wasn't a very high-impact game for the Scion early. He still farms, right? He still uses gold very efficiently and will, of course, infinitely scale, as you mentioned. Macaria will be a lot more relevant later on. And Zekka, you know, he ended up hitting his two-item spike, but has since kind of, uh, you know, made some interesting choices that have led to his demise. Yeah, and it's all about, it's like Viper versus Faker and Guma in this one. Yeah, and uh, I was actually a little bit puzzled earlier on today because we saw the break screen and normally it's like the lane matchups that's there, you know, you've got Viper versus Death or something like that. This time around it was actually Faker versus Viper. And now I've realized why, because that's precisely what this game is all about. Yeah. And Faker so far, you know, he does have that third item spike completed now. It took him a little bit longer because he went for the Maul. Is a very good choice into Zeko, obviously, in, in this uh, game. There's a lot of other AP sources. You saw the lifeline popped by Doran moments ago. But uh, now he's really going to be a huge threat in these neutral fights here. Yeah. The Baron being the, the next big objective to spawn that both teams are really going to be focused on in T1. He's already setting up deep vision for this. You can see Zekka, yeah, just on that bottom side of the map, does have teleport at the ready. Doran doesn't have his. That's why Zekka is spending time in the bottom lane. A little bit of a gank attempt there from T1. 44 minute, uh, seconds prior to this Baron. Ooh, As Peanut! She could be in trouble. This might to break the shield. Does manage to find the ulti. And boom goes the dynamite. Six and zero now for Viper. And Hummer Life Esports, they can have control of the river. How do you like that blast cone, Valdez? That's a f <laughs> I have seen pigs fly. <laughs> I've seen pigs fly right now on my screen, right, right there. No disengage cone this time. A T1 fan said maybe Peanut will fly. <laughs> maybe when pigs fly, I'll see that Peanut. Said you want to come over there and punish my Guma, but uh, Pigs did fly and Guma did die. Six kills for Viper. Hanwha Life at a very critical moment end up picking the enemy AD carry here. Now they have a free Baron take, or rather start. Not a take that, not just yet. Zekka has his ultimate available. Faker does have um, TP. Yeah, package also going to be picked up here. So he can teleport to the wave on the top side of the map. Hanwha Life Esports is going to back away from the Baron. Not wanting to deal with that, especially with the package available. Is now Carrier going to get engaged on? There is a hook that's going to land. He is so tanky, though. Uh, not going to be necessarily a target that you can burst down. Still, they get the destiny out from Zeus, who is now just going to turn his attention back towards his Baron one more time as well. He's found his way in behind enemy lines. Good zoning smash there from Carrier, but they're losing control quickly as Viper is level 16. Yeah, package is going to be delivered just to Peanut here as it was probably wearing off. And now Delight going to answer with that death charge. The flash over from Viper, the Assassin Zeri! And Owner is going to kick him away, but it's not going to be anything that's actually able to help out here. Is now Carrier taking damage. Owner will be taken down. There goes the Jungler, and T1 are falling apart. 
somehow that Glacial Prison connects onto Carrier. And now five versus three. Humble Life Esports will start off the Baron. Another hook is going to connect Sekka. on Isaias, And Sekka is going to make up for that ultimate from earlier. Peanut finds the Arcasol Flash. And Zayas will be taken down. His opposite number picking up the double. And there's the Baron for Humble Life. On will life, Esports gonna take this Baron and with it control over the map for the foreseeable future, if not for the rest of this game. Carrier, very tanky. See if he can get his way out of this one. Yeah, I don't it's think a portal so. combat. Here on the top side of the map, Doran is going to break that vow. And Carrier's running the wrong direction. He is likely going to die here. His ult is coming up. will almost be the ace, uh, but it's not actually gonna be the way. As now we're gonna check this one out one more time. Uh, this is how it all on starts. On award, man. On yeah. award. On award. This is how it all starts off. Enoch comes over here, flies across, and they get the zap for the kill there. The extendo beam comes over. And then this fight, obviously, it's going to be very broken up. The package is no value. Um, it doesn't even look like it was a package at all because it's just used on the wall there. And then Viper flashes for the kill. The fight's over at this moment. Like, there is nothing else you can do as T1, as Guma is trying to kite back into the front line, but Owner is isolated, and Guma is eventually going to get caught by Zekka, as he does come in for this follow-up. As look at this, we'll watch it forward. And turn on the Baron, Guma's like, well, I have to do damage. And even with the long range he has, he's in range of an Emperor's Divide. And Zayas with some fancy footwork, but... That was just clean play from Viper once again. He's taken this gold and being so efficient with it, so massive. 8-0 and 3, he's got his scimitar done. I don't know if the Zeri dies ever. Yeah, he is an absolute monster. He definitely hasn't died so far this game. There is a knock-up on a Peanut, and Peanut does not care about it whatsoever. 6,000 gold the lead for Hummel IP Sports. They denied the soul. That is not all that relevant because it's Chemtech Hook just barely going to whiff there from Delight. As you can see Zayas just trying to push out these waves so that Hummel Life cannot get more than just this bottom inhibitor. But the damage has already been done. The map completely belonging to Hummel Life at this stage of the game. And it looks like they're moving to match point. That is absolutely insane. Yeah, and I mean, T1, the drafts haven't been bad by any means, but game one, they they had a problem with the Senna. They gave it over with Nautilus, which we've seen has such an incredible long uh, win streak. I think it's 11 now. And then you move into the second game, and you get the Nautilus, but you get the Scion with it. A muted lane there, and it's Peanut who makes big plays early. It's Delight roaming all over the map, and Honor Life just seem to be the stronger team so far here. Yeah, they just seem to have a lot of the answers as well. In the draft, you saw that they did not hesitate. As soon as that center was locked in, they're like, all right, we've got Nautilus, we've got Sejuani, we're gonna play around that one. Then Viper Zeri comes in and we're like, oh, question marks, Nautilus Zeri, is that gonna work? But the gameplay around it was absolutely fantastic. You can see here by the damage dealt that playing around Viper is their bread and butter. They're gonna look for the engage on the carrier. He's very tanky, but his turret is now missing. He's now gonna look for a desperation engage. And it should not work out here as he's going to be going down into zombie form. Surely? Surely he is? Never mind, he's not. He's just incredibly tanky. The hook, the kick, it's going to work out here. But the disengage has to come through. And Hummel Life Esports, yeah, I mean, they managed to avoid <laughs> uh, dying to them. But look, they didn't do any damage. Yeah, it's, it's funny to watch the look on Peanut's face as well as everything is used by Guma and Owner to keep Karia alive. But it's just a Scion. You know, it's 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 not like you. It's a pick that's going to be the one that turns the fight around because it lived and it's going to go back to fountain and teleport on a flank. I mean, he did have TP, but he already used his ult to get away. It's not like Carrier could have been like, "Aha, now checkmate." I <laughs> uh, teleport behind you, and we actually re-engage. Not going to happen this time around. As Peanut and Hanwha Life continue to get a lot of deep vision here as best as they can to continue the siege. Yeah, once again, Carrier able to get vision down this time, but Peanut's there to immediately eradicate the rift of it. It's really hard here for, you know, T1 to come back in this game, but it's also hard for Hanwha to win it before the next Baron. You know, I think the next Baron is going to be where they try to close this one out. Yeah, they don't have a lot of range. They don't They're have a lot exactly of range. Exactly right. And they don't have, you know, an insane pushing composition either, even with this Azir and Sundis turrets, you know, in terms of just engaging and finding picks and then turning the game on its head, or rather finishing the game right in that moment. It's very difficult to do unless T1 makes a mistake. So they're just putting up deep vision. All they want to do is control this Baron. They don't even need the Chemtex uh, Dragon to come over. It's not even soul for them. And if, if T1 gets the soul, I don't think they care as much. They probably will contest that vision. 
But the Baron is really where they end the game, so that's what their main focus is going to be. Yeah, six items now for Viper. He has Flame Horizon everyone on the map. Uh, it is absolutely ridiculous. Depth Charge is going to come on through, but there is that Disengage Cone. Validation for Valdez. Uh, and that is going to deny any sort of pick here for Hummer Life Esports. Definitely great news for T1, though. If they had lost their jungler there, could have been dangerous. Although, I think he probably would have been back up and available for these objectives to come up. It is still very intense, but it does still feel like Hummer Life Esports have broken through that first layer and are now just looking to try and take this victory home. Doran going to push this wave in. Obviously, there's super minions on the opposite side of the map to where the Baron is, which is super frustrating for T1 to deal with. They have Faker's TP, they have Carrier's TP, so someone will be able to deal with that, but super minions are a bit of an issue here for the next minute 20. And Hanwha Life has such insane Baron damage right now. Yeah. They can kill it so quickly. They put up the Sun Desk gear, and they have basically permanent prio all over the map. Viper is level 18. <laughs> they have deep vision from, from top to bottom here across T1's jungle. Viper hit 18 before Doran did. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. He is our uh, highest level in the game as Delight is going to find Zeus. In goes Doran as well, and they will be able to lock him down. Gumiyushi, he just pops like a balloon, but still, Delight taking a lot of damage. The package delivered. Ona looks for the opportunity. Empress Divide avoided, but he can't avoid the prison. And now Faker has to flash away. He does manage to take down the Jax. The extended beam avoided as well, but he's still moving the wrong direction. I don't think it's going to be enough to save them. It's only three kills, TP. and Faker might be able to keep himself alive, but Peanut is going to come on over. He flashes. He doesn't <laughs> manage to lock him down. As you mentioned, the teleport out from Faker, but still, Hummelite Esports now, they've got Nexus turrets in their eyes, and they've got a match point that they're looking to secure. They could just go back and take Baron here. Very uh, funny series of events. You know, the fact that they try to flash on Faker to stop his TP, the fact that he gets out, means that T1 actually have these respawns coming through here, and there's no end from Hanwha Life Esports, nor do they get the Baron. And this is a really nice attempt here, I think, for T1, all things considered, considering where they are in this game. The game state is so against them here. They're trying to turn this around with package, but this desperation is just simply oh. not going to work. Not enough damage here. Delight is just tanky enough here, even though it's support Nautilus. And Baker, yeah, he does get out with his life here. Sidestep is insane. I don't know how that sidestep even worked. It didn't look like he avoided it, but, yeah. it, but I guess he did. Yeah, not fair. Uh, that is just goat things. Sometimes you just better. He sees the ones and zeros. <laughs> yeah, he does. And so far he's seeing the zero one in his scoreline, but he wants to change that narrative here on this Baron fight. They do no. have another fight in him. Yeah. Wolf, it's 6,000 gold to lead. Um, but we have seen already in this series, I don't think the gold really matters all that much. Both of these teams now with Soul Point available. But the so inhibitor has respawned as well, so T1 are allowed on the map. So many tools that aren't available for T1. No package, no flash for Faker, no flash for anyone but Caria. Yeah. And Hanwha Life Esports just put Doran in the top lane, continue to push this. And they say checkmate. Yeah, well, there's the control ward. It goes down. Zayas is going to get knocked up, and there is nothing he could do about it. Viper, 9 0 and 4 on the Zeri. He has gone from problem to disaster for T1, and Hanwha Life Esports are going to head towards his Baron Pit and look to try and push for the final time. If you're a believer in the butterfly effect, if you're a believer in, in dominoes falling over, it all started on that poor dragon take from T1 where owner got the smite steal, but Zeri got two kills. And You once certified it, Wolf, and once that certification goes through, it is very difficult to take it away. And I don't want to take anything away from Delight either, because I feel like this was his game. He oh, yeah. ruled the rift and set up Viper in so many ways, set up Doran in so many ways, and now the Baron it's going to be the siege to end here. I, I see no world in which T1 defend this. And look at how quickly everything goes down. Viper with six items is no joke. Doran going to help take down this inhibitor turret as well. He's a damage threat on top of it all. And inhibs all just going to be removed. It is textbook play here from Hama Life Esports. And T1, their map has all of a sudden gotten extraordinarily small. Zonia's for Zeka, Zonia's for Doran. There's no way to mess this up if you play it carefully in Hanwha R. Yeah, they're doing the very best. Kerry has a gigantic health bar, but he just can't really do anything else to stop Hanwha Life Esports from uh, getting on in here, making things happen. Guardian Angel done for Viper, so they're going to have to kill him twice in this fight if they are actually going to be able to hold on to this game. But you can see there are multiple Siege minions. 
still bearing down on the base. And now Doran goes in. He finds the Counter-Strike onto Zayas. And now Zekka gets in there. The explosion of damage is now they're in range of Viper. And that means that it's Hanwell IV Sports in range of winning this series with match point now available. Hanwell Life showing up in a big way in this best of five. One win away from joining Gen G, the top of the bracket for round three, to break the T1 Gen G narrative to say the number three put the put number two to the test at the end of regular season came in. I think in a lot of fans' minds as underdogs, a lot of analysts went both ways. It was very, very close. We knew a lot of it was going to come down to T1's read of the meta and form on the day. And I think Hanwha Life is coming up so far with both. Their form on the day and their draft reads into both oh, picking yeah. and giving the Senna have been what have defined this series so far. Viper walks away from game <laughs> two with 40,000 damage on the Zeri. That's 1,000 DPM almost exactly on this Zeri. He was funneled all of the money. Like Hamalai Life Esports, they had this clear plan and he was able to grab those couple of kills in the first skirmish, but the way that they just they saw their composition, they knew exactly how they wanted to play it out, and it all just worked out on top of it. This is a juggernaut of a team, and we'll see whether T1 can topple them and try and work on a reverse sweep. It's dangerous, but it's possible. Let's go to a short break, then the space, and then game three. アンドレスマンハットラインドロンダダビルバビルワンでトップロードですアンドレスビアビアンドワンアイトアラダインパラ。おだてー。でもね、クレカンボ볼거야。あ、アイディバアンパドおだてーがオッケーオッケー。そう
、ボディスラムフラッシュイン、いやただここはイメージ通りではないぞ、そしてエビがやってきてのゴールドカード、カイリンが大変完全に浮いてはいますが、まあまあ、そしてダッシャーを動かしてるのはジミエンダイージーストレードになっている、そしてイージェンに対して、うわー、フォレストがフラッシュからの結構打ったんですが、ただ、キャリーがダメージを出せるプレイヤーが完全に。地面によって押さえつけられていますそれでもマーブルがなんと地面を倒した,たそして生き残る生き残るフォレストまだ生き残るジェミニに対してはシールドフラッシュアウトジェミニもなんとか生き残りますがこのドラゴンのファイト勝ったのは SHG すごいプレイしたはずなんですけど、えー、そしてなんと帰り道フォレスト<笑><笑>
but Viper went cleanse and then also got a Merc Scimitar. So, you know, in the team fights, you didn't have a good option to lock down the Zeri, and it was just free free reign. Non-cleansable point-and-click CC. There's a need... very limited amount of that. You've got Vi, you've got Nautilus. Both of those were taken away, and uh, the Zeri did run rampant on the Rift. It was not okay to see Viper doing the things he was doing. Yes, the Drake was stolen, but this was kind of the first brick in the wall that did fall here for the side of T1. Yeah, and I think ultimately Viper goes pretty unchecked here, and it's just able to reliably put out damage. At this point, the Senna has a lot of utility, but the Scion isn't as tanky as like a Tom would normally be at this point, and the Corky isn't doing that much either. I mean, I still really think that it had a really poor decision making from T1. Like, sure, they, it's okay to go for just looking for still just straight, but instead they actually went for full fight mode, which is like I think it's just not really possible. It's like Zeri just got level his uh, six as well, and they have a Santa Scion with a mid quirky. It's just not really possible. Even even the fight started, it was like kind of forced, right? Like the HLE, like already he was hitting the Drake and it's like way for them to come in and where the fight was like just over the walls, like jumping over the, over the pit, like it was already really bad started. Yeah, and Viper from this point on kind of just ran the rift. That was two kills, a bit of a Zeri moment for him. He ended up in this game with like 10, 11 kills. It was ridiculous. We can take a look at this next fight as well in which Hamalei Peaceports were kind of able to seal the deal. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure the start of this was Faker grabbed the package to defend against a Baron, and then because they'd used the package, they're like, okay, well, we have to try and make something off it. But the ult comes down onto the Corky, and Viper's so quick to capitalize on top of Faker. This kick from owner achieves nothing other than an attempt to disengage, and once you lose one member against Zeri, the chase bound potential is so strong, you just end up losing so much more. I mean, these, even before this fight, actually, T1 was actually had a chance. It's like they were kind. The game was kind of even. They had a bad Baron as well. Like, it was really playable. But I think it's like it's a game. Like, I think today the T1 is just like not good at actually taking their time. The zone controls are not actually crisp today. So I think they probably like this is the main reason why they kind of have to change change the better plan like from the draft. I think. Yeah, and it's kind of rough. I mean, this is playoffs. This is, of course, double elimination, but T1 are coming in here kind of floundering, and Hamalei Feesports looking incredibly strong. I mean, at this point, is Hamalei Feesports maybe even better than Gen G after what we saw yesterday? I mean, it's a different matchup, but it is going to be interesting as the playoffs do come along, as Hamalei Feesports are looking very strong. But who was the strongest on the team for game number two? Let's see who just pick up the POG, and it will be Delight. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Viper was the recipient of all those kills. But Delight made such a great decision this game, and I think his pairing with Peanut has been one of the big strengths of Final Life Esports. Going to the top side, making these plays, sometimes we've seen Senna be the one leading the charge with roaming. Delight made sure he was there first, and not only did that give a ton of success on the top side of the map, but it basically meant Viper just got a free farm against a Scion, and it paid off so massively for the team. I think today, like, Delight actually just making this type of play, like, it's so important, like, as we said, like, it's just outside of the team, outside of the laning phase, it just shines even more that when enemy team make a really small mistake, he just go for it. He just click the button, instantly just flash R, and it's like, as you kind of mentioned, it's like, he forced move to the setup from the lane, and I think that's really big. And you know, we don't know for sure whether Honor Life Esports are going to be better than Gen G, mm -hmm. but I think Viper and Delight are definitely the best bot lane in the league right now, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. More of a rhetorical question. I, I'm just kind of hyping up what seems oh, to yeah. be Gen G up against Honor Life Esports for the, uh, you know, for the upper bracket matchup. And eight out of twelve, I think the Viper rights, uh, Viper votes are fine, especially because he had like eleven kills and didn't die in that game. And uh, Wolf, of course, did give the Zeri certification to him as well, although he still voted for Delight. As you can see, Wolf there <laughs> uh, stamping it on that certification. So pretty interesting stuff. T1 are going to stay on the blue sign for game number three. Is that going to be enough to get them across the line? I mean, I'd love to see see them get a game, but I just feel like they haven't found the solution, the win cons that work from them. I feel like you really need to get an advantage in the bot lane 2v2 and attack it. I feel like a lot of the lanes they've had have been like, oh, we'll just both farm up, and that hasn't worked. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's about the size selection. It has to be just done by just changing their plan from the draft, because like game one and game two, it was like really similar. But I think game three, I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be more spicy. It has to be. 
Yeah, I wouldn't have even minded them going to the red side and trying something new. I mean, after you lose a couple of games in a row, maybe try to mix things up, and instead they're just going to try blue side once again, and we'll see if that does work out for them as we throw it back to the casters for game number three. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for the breakdown of game number two. And yes, we're just hoping that it's not another 3-0 as Delight will pick up a very well-deserved POG for game number two. Man has been absolutely incredible. And I think getting him off Nautilus might be a decent start here in the draft. What do you reckon, Wolf? Yeah, I think that's probably a good plan. Probably just ban the Senna. And I, want, I don't want to see Faker on Corky again, even though it's one of his best picks historically. Um, it just doesn't offer T1 any agency. The Talia bans have been so strong here from Hanwha Life because they're just making sure that Faker can't make an impact early on in top lane and bottom lane. That's what T1's MO has been for like the last two years. In general, yes, they do sometimes play other stuff, but in general, it's been Guma in a pushing lane, Faker roaming, getting massively ahead early and snowballing those leads. But Hanwha Life has been getting the edge early in these games, especially in game two. And if T1 once again just play this Corky, try to play either side of the Senna, I do worry about what it means for trying to get ahead. I'd rather see T1 play something a little bit more aggressive, to be honest with you, Atlas. Yeah, I think uh, especially playing through the bottom lane with something a little bit more aggressive. And there is the Senna ban that you were talking about. That is going to be the adaptation here. As last time it was a Jinx ban that was the final one. Nico going to be taken off the board here as well. Great ban here. And there is the Callista lock-in. What does it mean for how this draft is going to play out, though? What is the answer for Hummel Life Esports? Varus? Because this is exactly the adaptation we were looking for. Varus, and maybe even you just go straight into the Talia here as Zekka, if you feel it confident that you can play it blind here, deny it from Faker, because these types of drafts are exactly what I was looking for for T1, where you grab the Callista early. Callista Nico has been super strong, even if it's Faker playing Nico in the mid lane. They love to play those Nocturne drafts when they're playing the Callista. So, Really smart adaptation here when they see the Senna ban to ban the Nico away. The Talia I mentioned will be Zekka's answer as they're just not going to allow Faker to make that roaming impact to the bottom lane. I think Hanwha Life have a similar read on this, this series as I do in, in that T1 wanted to pick up the Talia here. Now they're going to outrange it or outrange the Callista that is to say in the bottom lane. We'll see what the plan is going to be for support here. We've seen a lot of different stuff from Karia specifically with the Callista. Yeah. He's even played the Callista support himself. Well, Callista Rumble. Callista Rumble could actually be the lock-in here. We do see the Rumble locked down. We see the zoom in on Takaria as well. And that is Lissandra being considered here by Faker, something that can very much help with locking down that single target and really giving them some mid-game strength in this game as well. As Faker is just having, uh, having a bit of fun with us here, as we can see. Rek'Sai, a consideration as well, and will be locked in. Blind towards that top side, we'll see what Doran can actually do as a response, or whether they even can, because Nautilus, if they want it, they have to lock it in here. Yeah, and I think that they, they very likely just grab it, obviously, into the, the Rumble. You know, you can lock the Rumble down if he tries to push you under turret, and then the turret will be enough damage. Nothing really out damages Rumble's Flame Spitter except the turret. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And so if you could pull the Rumble into the turret, and just defend those dives with the, the roots that Nautilus can set up there. I think it is going to be what Delight wants here. As now with the Rek'Sai coming through, we know this is almost 100% confirmation the Rumble will be support, as you know, otherwise it's Rek'Sai jungle um, to come through here, which has not been meta for quite some time. Now yeah. they get to focus on Faker's champion pool here further in mid. I mean, not his pool, but champions he would like to play with this composition. Anything that has follow-up engage would be fantastic. So Azir is gone, the Nico is gone. They took the Talia away. And Orianna already banned. And there's not a whole lot left here in this meta right now that you'd want to play. I mean, besides the Lissandra, which they may also just ban, which I think would be wise. Otherwise, maybe an Ari pick here. Yeah, I was thinking Ari could be one of the options for Hamalife Esports to take away, but Lissandra, we have seen Faker use that so incredibly well in the past. And you just have to remember that he does have, like, even though he hasn't played that many champions, he's had some one-offs here and there, but it's mainly been about four or five that he's focused on this season. Ooh, we they, know that Faker does have them in his back pocket. They are considering that this Rek'Sai, you know, I mean, the Rumble, rather, would not be... The support. Rumble in the jungle? Yeah, it could be. It's definitely possible. Another pick I feel like that works really well with T1's composition that we haven't talked about is the Annie. Pretty tough to play into Talia, but one that Faker has pulled out quite a lot. Yeah. 
as uh, Genji, uh, you know, have uh, really kept it pretty standard in terms of their draft. T1 like to change things around quite a bit, and Hano Life just aren't ready to trust. They'll ban that Renata away. So strong in all ins into the Nautilus. They just don't want to give them that flexibility. And they're going to go even deeper on the uh, the all in with this draft as well with the Xinjiao. There is a Jax lock in, so uh, still not entirely sure as to where everything's going. Gwen, a uh, consider. Gwen? Gwen? No, this can't be real. Yeah, that would be weird. I was, I was thinking like, oh yes, Gwen. Um, but no, uh, don't don't really understand that one. And Faker with a wry smile as his Ari is going to be locked in. One of his favorite picks uh, historically. He's been fantastic on it. And does mean that T1 have really pivoted away from what have been late game drafts to far more mid game focus. This really does feel like their bread and butter because they've been so good at snowballing leads as Doran Onto his Aatrox here. That is his attempted answer. Into the Rek'Sai. We've uh, we've seen it before. And we, we're not super fans of the Aatrox into the Rek'Sai. Of course, Rek'Sai debuted in this matchup. Yes. I like the draft here from Life Esports. I, now, I think obviously this game is not about the draft purely. It's going to be about how much T1 can get done in the mid game with this composition. The Callista Rumble lane is going to be very powerful, but the... You know, the Nautilus here is actually so good at shutting it down, so, so good at shutting down dives. So Viper should be able to stabilize despite having an early deficit there. And then Talia is going to be another thing that is throwing a wrench into the, the gears here of this Callista push because she can roam down and really shut down these dives and shut down the push very carefully. You have to kind of manage when you're going to go in as Talia. You know, is owner following? Is he actually you know surfing on the bottom lane? A lot of vision is going to be required. It's tough to maintain vision in those bottom brushes because the push is always there. So there's going to be a lot of edges the Rumble has there. But when we get to late game, Rumble support ends up kind of just being an equalizer button and not the strongest equalizer either. Whereas you're dealing with a lot of really nice engage and lockdown. Even the Ari is going to struggle into this Nautilus later on that Delight has once again gotten his hands on here three times in a row in this series. Doran also will just pop the Rumble instantly, pop the Ari instantly with this late game Aatrox. So a little bit concerned here for T1 once again. Well, we'll just have to see how it goes. As ladies and gentlemen, we're on the rift for game number three. You could hear a little bit of the desperation in the T1 voices as they made themselves heard in the fan chants here at Lowell Park. And I think everyone kind of just wants this series to continue because uh, the level of intensity in both of the first two games has been extraordinarily high. And T1, I feel like this kind of pivot is exactly what they need. More early game pressure, early power, and especially here for this bottom lane, Carrier and Gumiushi have been so good in the past, and we'll see whether they can utilize this laning phase in order to find the advantage once again. And of these three drafts, I feel like this game has the potential to be, and I think it will likely be, a very one-sided game. Just simply because either T1 get it done in mid-game, or they don't. And there isn't really a, oopsie, we'll scale though, it'll be fine, <laughs> later on. You either win super hard, or you don't get big enough advantages and Hanwha Life just crush you uh, in the late game. And I don't think it's going to necessarily be that kind of knife's edge. We're looking at like nine kills to nine kills, 26 minutes, anything can happen kind of game. But I do think this style of gameplay is exactly where T1 are most comfortable. And that's why we were kind of hoping for a draft like this from them here in this third game. Glad to see they delivered. Well, Carrier, not going to quite find the first harpoon there, as we could see, as Delight once again moving into position. This game of cat and mouse uh, between these two. Very impressive. As, all right. Um, Viper going to throw the Hail of Arrows completely away. And finally, Carrier does manage to find himself a Harpoon onto Delight, who's now just going to walk towards him. Does find another one here. And it looks like T1 will regain control of the bottom lane. Something to be expected. Such a silly situation where Delight, now he knows he has the shield first, which you, all, you always will in this uh, matchup, unless you want to just all in into a rumble and die. He's like, all right, well, I'll just keep harpooning you. Now you're out of the brush. Yep. And uh, Delight is just pressing shield when he can. A little bit of mini game down there as this win rate, you know, we've seen this go both ways. It's been discussed a lot. I personally really like the Ari into the Talia, but it doesn't always work out with the rocks on the ground. Ow. Viper taking so much damage here. As you can see, Gumiushi with the Hail of Blades. 
Probably going to be the more lethality-based version, so very deadly in the early stages of the game as now Peanut has been found by Ona. I was doing a fair bit of work, but you can see Peanut looking for a little bit of a turnaround. When becomes Lightning does come in, as Zekka will have the inside track here on this particular battle. Blastcone comes on over, there's the flag forward, and Ona locks down first blood. Immediately it is answered, and somehow it's in fact Peanut that locks down the kill. And there is first blood, but an assist going over to Harmon Life Esports, so the gold is dead even. Yeah, I guess red buff is how that kill yeah. went over for Peanut. That's really unfortunate there for Harmon Life. Either way, more gold in their pocket, picking up that assist. I, I, I really like that owner was able to identify quickly, like I die no matter what, so I have to guarantee this kill onto Peanut there as soon as Zeki came over, because he's gonna have fast track, he can surf his way over there, and obviously they're on his side of the rift there on red side, so Zeki comes over there and does help grab that assist. Would have felt amazing for Hanwha Life if he actually picks up the kill, a big trade down, but still, Owner's gonna have that uh, first blood advantage. Yep, not gonna feel too terrible about this one. It is still going to be Peanut with a uh, few camps in advantage. Owner is going to be able to take down this Rift Scuttler, but the Gromp is now going to be secured by Peanut. So he heads up to 24 in comparison to the 16 that Owner has collected. So still, uh, Peanut winning out as far as the farm battle is concerned. Now going to be having a little bit of a look towards his mid lane. Faker using the very last of his mana, and Peanut just going to taxi his way through and we'll head up towards this Rift Scuttle on the top side of the map. Delight is just using his W to tank these Harpoons, and while they've been zoned out of a decent amount of farm here, we have seen much larger Rumble Callisto, or just in general Rumble Lane advantages than one, the one that we're seeing here for Viper, and Delight handled this extremely well. well Doran just gonna miss a few Qs here on Dezaeus, who utilizes the tunnel very, very nicely. Dezaeus is like everybody else, being just spamming Rek'Sai in solo queue. All of our top laners making sure that they uh, have it all down. Yeah, it's going to end up being a fairly boring matchup to watch um, unless Doran is hitting all of his abilities. Yep. And when he hits uh, none of them, it just kind of ends up being a wet noodle fight. And even if he being. hits all of them, Rek'Sai goes underground and everything's fine. Yeah. As, all right, we are... That's a, that's a weird time to go into a replay, but here we are in a replay. Here we are. So Peanut... Does have the red buff here, they're both burning each other, and you'll see the moment Owner realizes, okay, I have to actually go for this play. Will, of course, Flash follow onto Peanut. If the timing is a little bit better there for Peanut, perhaps end up getting the kill there before he can react, but Owner's never gonna mess that up. Yep. And uh, he ends up getting first blood, so really nicely played by him, all things considered. See here, Carrier is hit by a rain of arrows, and I was just checking Peanut. to see if coming to spells is okay. Peanut's coming on over. There's the flag forward. His Carrier does so much damage. Peanut's burning down. It's a one for one once again, but I don't think Peanut was expecting to die so instantly. Didn't have flash from the previous play, that replay we just watched. And I think a lot of players really underestimate the rumble damage in the bottom lane. We've seen this so many times because generally a support offers you a little bit of CC or like a small amount of damage when you go for these types of ganks, but Rumble will actually just hold Q and point towards you and kill you. Yeah. Um, and it ends up being Gumayusi who actually picks up that kill, which is massive here. If it's actually just a Rumble getting the kill, that's still decent for T1, but the fact that it goes over to this quickly um, becoming lethal Callista here as it's traded back to Viper is still pretty significant. Now, T1, small gold advantage. This has kind of been the story of all of these early games. It's, this one, our bloodiest yet, but still, Small gold advantage for T1. Let's see if they can get anything out of it. Yeah, it's been even trades almost this yeah. entire game so far. You can see one for ones uh, represented by the 2-2 two -two at the top of your screen. So no one really able to find any big advantages as Hex Flash being utilized here by Carrier, having some fun on the bottom side of the map. Viper and Delight going to be able to get rid of this vision. So we're going to see this once again as Peanut just opts into the barbecue. So Karia has the Scrap Shield and actually opts to flash in to make sure he can maximize that damage there. So he is actually at the um, heat required to do the damage that's necessary in order to kill Peanut there. Just really good reaction from Karia. Without his really nice play there, obviously this ends up being a disaster. But yeah, if you're the Rumble support, you've got to know those timings. You've got to know your damage. Karia absolutely aware of it. Also uses the flash to dodge the hook at the same yeah. time, so it's like double duty. I think maybe he was going to flash in anyway, um, but really nicely done just to get double value from the summoner spell. As in this mid lane, very, very even. In this bottom side of the map, it is still control picked up by T1. That control, uh, sorry, the control, the uh, siege minion. 
Unfortunately, not going to be collected here by Viper as Ona walks over a ward. Uh, but still, T1, even though it's not going to be a successful gank with a kill or anything like that, should still be a lot of zoning being done. Plate will go down as now Zekka is going to try and mitigate it as the flick back onto Carrier, who doesn't have his flash. The hook gets in the way of the minions, though. And Zekka, he has to flash to get himself out of, the, out of dodge. A dangerous situation as Faker is clearing out vision here as well. He is very dangerous with Spirit Rush available. There is an equalizer and Zekka, he's down to 100 now underneath this turret. He, this is so dangerous as now Carrier looks to come in. He is definitely, never mind. The Fate's Call comes on down. Viper is burning and Carrier is able to lock that one down. Zekka was free food there under the turret and that's going to be lapped up by Faker. And finally, they get a kill advantage. Yeah, T1 with a huge swing of gold here after this play. And, I mean, the key of all of this is the Weaver's Wall just stops a little bit too short. His owner? Yeah, there's another hook. It's going to connect there. They don't have a lot of damage. No, he should be fine. He's got ult. He's got Counter-Strike. He has Flash. He's, he's not worried about anything. But the, the fact of the matter is, without Delight there, Viper just can't be under turret. And you could see that the wave was stacking up because Viper was waiting for Delight to come back. He's just not going to be able to get it done without him. He didn't have level 6 Delight for that skirmish, which is really important in this moment. And the Weaver's Wall comes up short, and then Carrier's just like, well, I ult them, and then we can kill Zekka really easily. The Fate's call timing here is so good, as Carrier just hard forces the maximum amount of damage he can realistically get done here. The Ignite goes down as well. That is the <laughs> and he actually opts into dying. Yeah, I don't that know about that. That was a very weird move. Not entirely uh, sure what that was about. Yeah, missed that one entirely. His hook is going to go wide. Uh, Carrier able to avoid it. But I think that as far as that play is concerned, Carrier dying to the turret, Hooney would be very proud because that is just pure aggression. No fear. Yeah, he just wants no to defense. go in, and he's not worried about whether he lives or dies. <laughs> That's 100% true. Is now uh, Gumiyoshi going to help out with these Ren stacks as owner should be able to deal with this. Is now Peanut going to get dove on, has to flash. Get out of the way of the rumble as soon as that first harpoon lands, especially with the fact that he has his sword boots now completed. This is on top of it. This is the best early game T1 have had in these first three games, oh, yeah. and it is a huge gold lead for them now. 1300. They stack that first dragon. It is not going to be a Chemtech Soul. We were able to identify that now too. It's going to be the second dragon here, so that feels really nice. And. That, that bottom side play got them such a massive advantage. I mean, look at the CS as well, still massively favoring Guma here, 15 up. Viper not able to do anything back in this lane, and Faker is just, you know, constantly putting the pressure on here. It's never really a, a fun feeling to play into this rumble lane when it's actually working, once it's starting yeah. to get ahead. The Weaver's Wall from Zekka on that last play, if it's longer there, you know, if he had a level 11 Weaver's Wall, or if he's able to get there a little bit faster, maybe they make something of it as Viper. Yep, he's gonna have to walk down the red carpet. There's a flash in, as once again, they've got Fate's Call, and so he can freely do this. The hook is gonna go wide as Ona is once again back in the leap strike, will lock down the kill. And now, Delight is trying to grab one back. We'll be able to do so as Carrier will help grab some plate gold. Weaver's Wall going to come in as well as Zekka. He came from the other direction. That's absolutely insane. As now, Peanut diving on in. Wind becomes lightning. He's going to do a fair bit of work there, but Carrier still able to create the distance to get himself out. And T1 not going to find the charm as Wind becomes lightning comes through once again. Peanut closes the gap as Threaded Volley. Faker does have to use that charge. And they will be able to make it out to safety. Still, Zeka able to push them out. Will yeah. be able to get a plate possibly after this as well. Oh, never mind. Not quite, although might be able to get it on the next wave. Probably so, as Viper is able to get mid lane as well. So he's able to come over here and farm these minions up. Going to be a while before Guma can go match that, or Faker in this oh case. Oh, dear. Peanut well, stayed. Yeah, Peanut, he's still here. Gumi, she's at full health. They're still going to go for this dive. Threaded Volley is fantastic. There's the seismic shove, and Peanut. He wasn't going to die to that one. They'll take the plate and they'll take the kill. And Viper gets a plate mid. No answer from Faker who had to teleport to make the play happen in the first place. And what looked very good for T1 initially ends up being a great play for Hanwha Life. And, you know, I, I was watching this moment going, okay, well, this is pretty doomed. I don't know if Han will get anything back, but Delight has some really nice plays here as well, is able to get the root. And then obviously the ultimate is really fantastic from him. Guma has to heal. It's not enough. And then on the follow-up here, okay, we're going to skip a lot of the Zekka <laughs> yeah. shenanigans. On the follow-up here, um, Kuma is just dead, and his jungler is heading back topside. As they just expected Peanut to back, they didn't really have any idea. But obviously, the Sentinel does see Peanut, but after it's too late. And, and man, uh, the value of Talia, you'd put rocks underneath the uh, Callista and then put a seismic shove where she wants to go. 
There were not a lot of good options. No, there's like almost, I mean, there is literally nothing you can do in that situation. Maybe just like regular walking. But no Callista really wants to regular walk when you can do your martial pose stuff. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, still, Gumiushi is very strong. One, two, and three. And is still ahead by about 10 CS opportunity. Now done. Ghostblade is completed here for Viper though. And does have some Swifties to avoid getting slowed down by these Harpoons and dying immediately. Viper? Okay, hold up. Zekka? Yeah. Charm is going to miss. Flash is going to come on through for Zekka though. So good work here from F Faker to keep the pressure up. Flash advantage now secured for T1 in mid. This lethality build for Kalista has been so popular and it has been quite strong, especially if you have map control and you're winning really hard. And they certainly were um, in the early game, still have an advantage, but I feel like Viper is just going to be better um, poke Kalista because he actually has range and he is going to be building lethality himself. And once you, you get to the point where the Varus is going to start really hurting in these fights and really chipping away at T1. It makes even the Ari's life more difficult to play these fights out. As yeah. whenever we peel up to here, I'm always like, is somebody hiding in the brush? We have all vision on. Speaking of hiding, uh, Charm is going to connect onto Peanut here, but the Weaver's Wall is going to come on down. Faker does get out of the way of the rocks, but he's just going to get taken out. The Flash was already used, and he's just going to die. And now we're taxiing over to Gumiyushi, who's also taking massive damage. Peanut locks that one down. It's a double as the bottom lane evaporates, and Ona is trying to get something back, does take down the Varus, but the Threaded Volleys are chasing the Jack through. Still the Empowered One not going to connect as Peanut not flashing in. Um, um, okay, I'm not sure about that one, but the threat of Volley will save him. And Home Life Esports find a big team fight. Yeah, it's a two for one here coming through, but at the end of the day, the fact that Zeka picks up that final kill is massive. Peanut is getting so big in this game. And even though his flash play looks like a bit of a whoopsie, it helps Zeka secure the yeah. kill, so he'll take it in the end. And man, all the wind is out of the sails here for T1 now, who find themselves nearly at a 2,000 gold deficit. It's a 4,000 gold swing, more or less here, after these last two plays, bottom side into the skirmish mid. As Venus just lurking here, Wind Faker goes to ward. Half his health bar is gone, I and mean, he's got Sundered Sky so early that Xin Zhao is not messing around, and the Rumble ultimate here just isn't enough to zone. Fate's Call attempt here from Guma is pretty cool to maybe see if that knockup is going to be the one to turn oh the tides, but the damage is just gone. And the W and powered Q damage from Viper just tearing apart this bottom lane. But then Peanut. And this, yeah, this is weird. Um, yes. But thankfully, Zeka was there. Uh, was almost a leap strike in power, and uh, it was just doomed as okay. Hook and a connect. On to Carrier once again. Chains of Corruption pretty powerful as well. As they're now just right in the back of this pit. Peanut going to be taken down first though. As Zekka comes on in finally. Carrier keeping himself alive for so long but will finally go down. And it's a two for one again here for Harmer Life Esports. But Faker closing in. Kumiyushi still here as well. Charm going to land a Faker just pops like a balloon. Delight has been a god today and that's not going to end in this game. He has the Titan's Wrath and Zeus Nothing he can do 1v4. The light is just insane! The guy just knows how much he can do, how much he can take in terms of damage. He has no fear. And I cannot believe T1 let this guy have this champion three times in a row. His knowledge has been so fantastic. 10 out of 13 KP right now. And these skirmishes are not going T1's way, but they need to fight early. They need to get tempo advantage. They've already lost control, so they're just kind of indexing into, we better win this fight. And Peanut, Crescent Guard isn't great here. He takes a ton of damage, but he also tanks so much damage that the fight is already won. Kuma has to flash because he loses out on bottom side. And at this point, Karia is just trying to buy time. They end up picking off owner, and these fights are never going to go T1's way, unfortunately, in these moments. And then Faker's like, hold on, I think we might have one more chance of this, because again, they have to win these fights early where well, the game ends, and then Delight just says, absolutely not. Gets the <laughs> shield here, denies Guma, and that is that. And that may just be the first step to the end of this series. The fact that Hanwell were already taking back control was one thing, but that last fight almost feels like, even at 17 minutes here, the last nail in the coffin, T1, in massive trouble, the Callista that they draft Pyod here with the Rumble sitting at one and four. The Rumble beside her same kill score line. Oh, the hook is going to connect. Chains of Corruption do come down though, and that is going to spell the Fates call out from Gumiyushi. Now Carrier not going to be nearly as aggressive. Uh, it's only 17 and a half minutes into this game, so no Barons to talk about just yet. I was uh, thinking that because we were around the Baron pit, that maybe that was going to be the situation, but no, not to be the case. Is now Doran. He's going to go back to base. 
he was also uh, pretty pivotal in that last fight. But I'm going to have to hold that thought as the Weaver's Wall comes in. Seismic shove, throws back Rumiushi, but no rocks on the ground. So we'll be right for now as the Equalizer comes in. Lots of value, but the hook out from Delight. And he says no to any sort of re-engage. Speaking of re-engage, Shelly is still getting annoyed at Peanut uh, and is once again going to reset. Guma avoiding that shove is massive. Didn't have the flash. Oh, Charm gonna connect, but it's Delight. He's still taking down a half health, as of course, he is not the center variety of the no, Atlas. Certainly not. But man, Atlas, I mean, these, these fights, these skirmishes are not going T1's way. The Charm connects, but it's onto a tanky Nautilus who has Merc Treads. He just yeah. doesn't really care. Honda Life Esports is going to take this Scuttle, the Mini Baron. You know, you were like, oh, are we going, are we going to Baron Pit? It does <laughs> yeah. feel like they have taken that much control over this game. And the fact that Viper is sitting at four kills, six assists here, is about to be an item up on his counterpart, Guma, who did have huge advantages after the initial uh, early game with the, the Rumble push. Just wild how much swing Hanwha have gotten in this game. Uh, this is going to be a bit dangerous for Doran, who's going to try and umberly dash away from Zayas, and will just uh, be enough. Weld Ender is going to be employed, and so that means that they at least get something for their trouble. The Faker roaming up towards the top side doesn't get too much value. Oh, it is Infernal Soul. You know, we've been talking about all the action here. It's it, We knew it was going to be a better Drake than Chemtech, but... All right, scary. Looking a bit scary. But yeah. Too much else going to be found in the outer turret in mid lane. will just go down. And what I was going to say about the Infernal is just that I feel like that's maybe one way if you could stack uh, that early here as T1, you could give you some longevity in this composition, but I think the, the control is already lost. I don't know if they get to stack any more dragons. I don't know if they ever get another dragon in this game, and that's the scary thing, but at least it is somewhat hopeful that perhaps maybe with one mistake, one great charm, and to a Jax Counter-Strike, somebody's out of position, Viper overextends. There's a way back into the series, a way back into the beginning of the reverse sweep. Yeah, uh, it's possible. They've also got the two Drake buffer, so they don't need to worry about Soul coming through for an extra 10 minutes in comparison to what it could have been. But with an early game composition like this, it just doesn't feel fantastic to be this far behind. And we say this far behind, it's only 2.5k, right? But when you're staring down the barrel of Talia, Aatrox, when you have the Rek'Sai and the Callista and the support rumble, right? You're supposed to be more than 2k ahead at, this, at 20 minutes if your comp is winning. And they're 2k behind, as you say. Ooh, Colonel Chain's gonna pull back Zayas, but he tunnels. And Delight not gonna be able to find the hook for that reason. I mean, this Rumble hasn't even gotten the Leandries at 20 minutes. I mean, that, that tells the story of this game. Ooh. Peanut hunting for Carrier is now the flash forward from Delight. He's just going to press the R button on the Gumiyushi. And the Weaver's Wall is going to get the flash out. The Equalizer comes down just to slow them down. But oh my god, the damage from these Qs out of Viper Charm is just going to be avoided here by Doran. Who's going to turn it around, gets the flash out from Carrier. And Ona has to leap strike his way out. They are running for the hills. And Hummel Life Esports do get control of this dragon. First Infernal Dragon will be theirs here. Really flashy way to start off and, and guarantee they get this prio. No kills go over, but it's very successful. T1, there is no way they are going to be able to take this turret. They put only a small dent in it. Well, that's going to be the uh, cross map, you could say, for the Dragon. And flash down on Guma, flash down on Karia. These are scary things to hear if you're a T1 fan when Aatrox is on the loose. And we mentioned this in the draft, the Aatrox against this very squishy composition, especially the Rumble support who has to try to clear vision against Hanwha Life is never what you want to see. They're going to be able to grab this bottom turret here as well, this Aatrox getting larger by the second. And Hanwha have been so good at controlling their leads. So every time yeah. they get a lead, their vision control has been so oppressive. Bit of an interruption, but uh, Zayas is still going to be able to make it towards his bottom side. Shelly, not going to get punished. Her gold is going to go to the nether, or to the void, I guess. And inner turret is secured on this bottom side. That gold lead ballooning for Hummer Life, now over 3,000. And Hummer are just moving into their jungle. Okay, there's a seismic shove onto this. Rek'Sai does try to get on top of Viper, but he's just not low enough. No execution available. Immediate teleport from Doran gets him towards his top side so that there is no cross map play to be had. And man, Hummel Life Esports came to play today. And you can just feel the desperation oh, out of T1. One. One as the Q connecting, Carrier just gonna get wiped out by Zekka on his Talia that's starting to become one of the champions in his wheelhouse. Wolf, we mentioned that he's been so improved on this pick, and it's once again proving true. Uh, Hanwha Life, I mean, they're playing around him so beautifully. Yeah, the Weaver's Wall on the bottom side play earlier wasn't enough. It was so close to being enough. 
But man, he has just improved so massively. And with the vision that Zayas had, it looked like a good call there. Perhaps he thought Doran had already teleported topside or maybe at back there. It looked like maybe it was a good play, but he's trying to find any angle he can right now. Same with Carrier here. He's just fishing for maybe I have the damage. Maybe owner collapses with me because there is no other way back into this game but to then find a hard forced pick into Hanwha Life. But if Hanwha Life keeps stopping you, your chances get slimmer and slimmer every time you miss them. Oh dear, Peanut finds Owner one more time. When becomes Lightning will not find the mark as the Weaver's Wall left a little to be desired as Equalizer going to come down to protect the teleport. Still, Delight just straight up does not care about that one. Peanut also getting taken down relatively low, but that double knockup was too good! And now Faker is having to get out of there. It's not going to work out. Still, it's a fair bit of damage, but it is not enough. They are too strong. Still, into the back line goes Zayas. Zeka able to find a lot of damage onto the Rek'Sai, and he shouldn't be able to get out. Still, those couple of kills onto the bottom lane could be important to try and keep T1 in there. Still, it's going to be the ace, and it should still be the Baron for Hanwha Life. I don't think I, anybody would have predicted, a lot of people predicted Hanwha, there were no three zeros. There were only two three ones for me and Chronicler, but nobody would have walked into this series, not even the most intense no Hanwha Life fan. No one brave enough to commit to but, the 3-0. But no one would have expected this was going to be a more one-sided series yeah. than Hanwha and Kwangdong. And I mean, Kwangdong had bigger leads than T1 had in their early games where they had advantages. And Hanwha Life are just rolling over T1. And yes, this game state was bad and it has been bad for the last 10 minutes. So nothing T1 does is going to look good. And the lead is just going to continue. But you can't just give up a Baron. You have to come over here and contest. And Hanwha Life with their composition. The expiration date for T1 was so long ago, and you can really feel and smell the stink of what this comp is gonna look like. 7,000 gold behind, 24 and a half minutes in. The Baron goes over to Hanwha Life, and they are just stacking these Infernal Dragons. Yeah, uh, one minute and 20 seconds on that second one for Hanwha Life Esports, if they would like it. Two and a half minutes still left on the Baron. T1 now with only Desperation plays remaining, really is what it feels like here. They know that the expiration date has pretty much been and gone on this composition as far as needing to get advantages. Still, there is always the death brush. There is, there is always the try to wait for Home Life Esports to make a mistake. Isaias he is going to have a little bit of attention here, eats the CC as he tunnels his way out. But now still with this minion wave bearing down on the top in a turret, it is likely they are just going to be able to take this one. Equalizer does come on through, doesn't do a lot of damage to these minions as they're barroned up. And the flash out from Carrier as... All right, Doran, I'm not sure about this one, but still, he pops the World Ender. He's going to go down, but Carrier should follow suit. Zayas gets back underneath his turret. Faker is just in the side lane, trying to get them whatever bounty gold they can find. And it's working, because the Baron power play has gone down. Yeah, he is actually staying here as well. Zeka's gonna come over to deal with him. Really like the trap they set up there for Doran. Ends up taking him out. Took a long time, because Lethality Aatrox is no joke. Uh, they might also be able to find themselves a dragon. Yeah, they might be able to now. Okay, there's an interruption on Dezaeus. Uh, they're, they're buying time to secure the dragon. Uh, which they are going to be able to do. Yeah, at the cost of their inhibitor turret here, as Zeka is also pushing mid. One dragon here, if it was Infernal Soul, you'd feel pretty good about this. It's just really going to feel like bounty gold, and the threat of an Infernal Soul fight Hanwha Life aren't really concerned about here in trade for inhibitor turrets. And a kill on to Zayas, as they're actually just going to get the whole inhibitor. T1 trying oh. to set up the flank. Yeah, Zekka in trouble. He's going to get charmed up. It's a lot of damage out from Faker as the flash has to be employed. Still, Hanwha Life Esports are continuing to push. Uh, this, in, this Nexus turret taking down to 50% health, and Weaver's Wall will get Zekka on over. So five members of Hama Life Esports now in position, but they do want to back away. Kabuyushi does get his shield broken. Hughes are hitting their mark here from Viper, and they'll get themselves a Nexus turret and an inhibitor turret, and the inhib on the top side of the map for that Baron power play, 2.5k. The Seraph shield there coming up big for Zekka as he does survive here. This is a really cool trap as they know that Doran is rotating over here. There's not a whole lot of vision here for Hanwha Life, so Doran just kind of walks his way into this one. Blast cones in, has to flash away. Wild Faker is getting that bounty, so the idea here for T1 is to maybe trade one for one, grab some gold bounty, then push for the dragon. But Hanwha Life, they don't choke. They don't actually hesitate. They don't mess this up. They don't play slow. They're like, oh, okay, well, we can't match Faker there. We can't stop the dragon, but we will get the inhibitor. And since you don't have Infernal Soul, this is definitely going to be worth it. 
Isaias unfortunately just did not know the light was sticking around and will die for his trouble, but at least buys time for them to get the dragon. Problem is, without him, there's no defense for the inhib. And now this Nexus is missing a turret, and Anwalaif just give no quarter in this series. They really don't. I think Viper and Delight actually almost strategically stood still to avoid getting seen by the Tremesens. And so Zayas kind of walked into his death there. It was really, really cute play around the mechanics of the Rek'Sai. He does have three items. He's very tanky, but Hamalai Esports, they are looking to take down this inhibitor turret. And every auto from Viper is so scary still. The equalizer does come down. Chains of Corruption go wide. But still, how did T1 approach? There's rocks on the ground. There is so much poke available here as well. And there's a hook that's going to connect. The charm lands onto Viper. Zayas gets into the back line as well. And Viper is going to be taken out. Delight is extraordinarily low. They take down the rumble. But T1, this is the best fight they've had so far. And Gumiyoshi is still untouched. Doran trying to get some work done, but he goes all the way into the sky. Oh my god. Never you mind. This Aatrox is too big. And he's just jumping all over the top of T1. Uh, he missed a lot, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> He's Lethality Aatrox, and he won't miss the autos. And once he gets on top of Guma, he takes him out there. Great fight for T1, all things considered. They thinned out the wave with the Equalizer. They focused down Delight, even with his arm guard there. That's a lot of tunnels for Zayas here. As Doran, he doesn't quite have the longevity in these fights that Zayas has, but he does have a lot of minions yeah. inside the base. And that last Nexus turret here gets very low with Carrier respawning. Even he is going to struggle to clear this one up. Oh, Down it goes. Yeah. So now it's just an open Nexus here. Honor Light fans let out a huge cheer. And once again, Pe uh, Peanut's got his hands off the keyboard, knowing that this one is basically just about dotting his eyes and crossing his T's here. As Delight's engage here is a little bit suspect, but remember, he's able to flash and kill Faker, and he has the arm guard, and then the disengage here from Peanut is fantastic, but ends up getting himself slowed here under turret. Doran, he misses a lot. Zekka is a Talia trying to brawl against this Rek'Sai and Jax, but immediately, um, or not immediately, ultimately, Doran, despite missing a lot of abilities here, will just auto-attack his way to victory. Yeah, gets a bunch of resets with that World Ender and is able to just flap his way around. This, uh, yeah, I mean, the Aatrox is now 5, 1, and 6. It just he doesn't matter so if he misses scary. or not. He just yeah. eventually kills you. Yeah, like, hit them with your buttons and your auto attacks and stuff like that. He's got the Profane Hydra. The three items that he needed have been completed. Cyrilda's now done as well. Is now Hamalai Beastball is getting to work on this Baron. My god, it goes down so quickly. The wall is put in the way of T1, and there's nothing they can do about it. I'm alive now with another Baron ready to push down on an exposed Nexus, remember. Faker loses a third of his health bar, just the one arrow. And doesn't find the charm as Delight will find the hook onto the Rek'Sai. Not exactly an optimal target. And now Peanut, he's going in. Equalizer goes down. Crescent Guard, my god, this damage is disgusting! And I'm alive. will just get rid of the bottom lane immediately. The knockup comes in, the prepared seismic shove. And, yeah, that Void Rush not going to be enough to save the Rek'Sai this time. And Hummel Life, a 3-0 over T1 in round two of playoffs. T1 will now have to face off against D plus Kia in the lower bracket. A very, very decisive and one-sided series here from Hanwha Life Esports. It may be recency bias, but they made T1 look just as simple as taking out Kwangdong in round one as this was just better drafting across the first two games especially, but in game three, if they survive the early game, if they win those early game skirmishes, they turn the game around, they should be able to come back. And it's Zekka on the Talia once again that gets it yeah. done. His Talia has been so improved. It used to be a pick in the past where we'd say take it or leave it. He's not a bad Talia player, but it definitely doesn't stack up to his Akali, to his uh, Yone. But it is definitely up there now with his Azir, which he also took two games in this series with. And T1 going to the lower bracket here. And I wouldn't call it an upset because we knew this definitely could have gone Honda Life's way. Yeah. It's about 50-50. But the 3-0, that result is definitely unexpected. And I think it's momentum as well, right? It's the fact that T1 managed to take down Hamalife Life Esports in round robin one. But then in round two, Hamalife Life Esports were able to take that one back. They knew that they had the read to be able to take down T1 once again, and they did so. So despite the even score lines, but T1 taking second place, Hama looking so <laughs> scary, and Delight as well, as he throws down the dredge line. Three games in a row of Nautilus 
And I think that if you're looking for a matchup into Harm Life Esports, the Gen G are, um, you'd probably be thinking about maybe banning away the Big Daddy. I know, think the Nautilus. so. I think it might be something to get rid of. Now, one thing I will say about T1 is that they have been one of our best improving teams. The, the team that you'd be most scared of who makes a lower bracket run that shows Ooh, up in the yeah. finals. And so do not count this squad out. They have a super strong, well-staffed coaching staff, um, including, you know, coaches such as Coma, who have been, uh, you know, his Somewhat successful, you can yes, say. Um, very, very winning. Um, and and non-coaches who are basically coaches such as Faker. So uh, I, I do think that T1 can bounce back from this. They can recover from this and maybe make that potential run, especially when you consider that there's a ton to learn from D-plus as well, and that team is so on point right now. If T1 are able to, to t stop that momentum and make that way to the lower bracket finals and go to the, the finals themselves, that might be the scariest T1 we've seen in the finals. And maybe that T1 could actually beat Gen G. You know, they've struggled the last few times around. These fights, these skirmishes that they opted into here in this game as well just really backfired and allowed Hanwha Life to get back into this game, and it's the exact worst case scenario here for T1, they had a small lead, but they tossed it all away. Yeah, they did. And uh, Hummel Life Esports collected it so beautifully. Once again, I mean, Delight having an absolute outing today. I think it's be between him and Zeka for me as far as POG votes are concerned. But man, I don't mind who gets it. I just think Delight has had an absolutely incredible uh, playoff so far. And he was somewhat muted throughout the season, right? We weren't talking about Delight as that sort of support goat that we were kind of saying, um, you know, was starting to whisper towards the end of last year. But uh, when it comes to playoffs, man, this guy looking absolutely clutch. And maybe we should have always known that he was going to be clutch, having been a player on Bro in the past. Yeah. Final moments here. Falling for Ari. And this is like too bad when Baker got away. Yep. And pushing for Kalista. What the heck was that damage? Actually insane how much damage Peanut does here. Plus Viper. They're saying this is good. Let's keep going. Uh, Zayas. And getting a call out to try and kill the Rek'Sai. And they're just saying, we're tanking. Let's just end the game. And that is precisely what they did. You can see the elated faces on Harmalife Esports. <laughs> Even saying, did we actually manage to pull this off? Did we do this? And then a good old Naisu at the end. Having a look at the damage done, yeah, Doran uh, participated in a few fights towards the end there. And Carrier, understandably, doing the most damage on his team. His uh, Rumble certainly getting a fair bit of work done, but also not really finding the longevity in these fights and in this game. Hanwha, yeah. I mean, right now with Gen G struggling a little bit into D plus yesterday, Hanwha looking very clean, strong drafting. Weren't really tested, I feel like, that much in the series, nor in draft, so it's hard to say, but. Maybe, you know, there will be some Hanwha votes in the Genji Hanwha series predictions coming through. This team is on fire right now, and maybe we'll get a different finals this time around here in 2024 spring. Yeah, I mean, it was five games for Genji against D+, right? Like, I mean, you're talking about the upper bracket. Like, what do we predict for the lower bracket, Wolf? Like, how are you supposed to figure that one out? I don't know. I'm just I'm just going to put in a pass. I think <laughs> I'm going to say, geez, son, I'm sorry. I'm just not doing it, not making a prediction for that series. Uh, because it just doesn't make any sense in my mind. But Hum Life Esports, I think what we can say is that they've just been incredible. And now to talk about them, we're going to throw it over to the space to break down the series. Thank you, Atlas and Wolf, for your wonderful work today, albeit a little bit short. Another 3-0 when Valdez isn't casting uh, coincidence, I think not. But yeah, Hum Life Esports getting the big 3-0 tonight, and honestly, just very well deserved. An absolute flattening of T1. Not very close in this one. Guys, how did they do it? Uh, well, I think one thing that was consistent in all three games we can talk about in the draft was that the light got Nautilus again. And, you know, Nautilus has been such a high priority consistently just because of the fact, obviously, the point-and-click CC is so viable against picks like Zarya, like Callista, but also just like in all of these fights, like the reliable, the, the range of the engage is like, you know, compared to a champ like Rel, you really need Flash to get the longer range engages, but no, just you throw that Q out the dredge line so far, and it feels like he had so much impact across this series. I also think like Callista gets locked in and immediately you have Varus, Talia. One of them is a very hard lane matchup, and the other, it just makes the game so hard, so hard to even play Callista. And we saw Guma go for the uh, Lethality Callista, because obviously you're not going to be able to auto that much, but it just really didn't come through, especially when you're against an Aatrox in Zhao, where Lethality Callista is never cutting through them.
Yeah, I mean, it's about the, the only game, right? Like, the, definitely T1 just the, really abused. Oh, we're gonna just try to attack as much as you uh, you guys, like, on the bottom, especially. Just bring up the, the colors that rumble on the bot lane. And also, jungle with the Jax is just trying to push out as much as he can or, or get, uh, in, into the Zins out there. And it's just like the execution has to be done. Like, as we already talked about it from the pre-show echoing again, which is even though you prepare, if you prepare more about the domination, all the game, the competition, you actually have to do it. It has to be done, but the execution wasn't really perfect. So I I mean, obviously HLE get a, a lot of big chances later in the game. Yeah, you know what's really good against that bottom lane dive strategy? Nautilus as well. You, you click people, they get rooted. It really makes the dives difficult. He's very tanky. He's engaging on the people who are trying to get out of range. It just makes it very easy to handle. But it wasn't super easy to handle in that early game. There were some moments, but still, Humble Life Esports, they get through it, and eventually they have a couple of big fights here in the early to mid game that turned this game on its head. Yeah, and this one, you know, Faker goes down, he didn't have an ult at this point, and T1 move in to try and kind of protect him or maybe turn it into a fight, but they end up committing into the situation where, you know, immediately they lose two extra members and then Ona tries his best to fight his way out, but he's 1v3 in this situation. And I feel like it was just such a poor fight to opt into for T1, like just let Faker die and live to fight another day. And this is like two minutes after, right after, like they just kill it and a base and it's, they stick together, together here. And let's just look at where the right side between and also Aatrox is. I mean, that's why the T1, they can't really go full hand, to the, even though the fight wasn't, fight wasn't like really to one side, but it just really doesn't matter. It's just because the right side is still on the way and still just eyes on Rexa, he just scooping out. But before the HLE already make a really great decision making, just gone to the Ari and the Kalista, and obviously Rexa just, he was a swimming whole day. I just think it's crazy <laughs> He's how- He's great at swimming though, at least, yeah. I think it's crazy how coordinated Honda Life Esports are in their setups for fights and when they're engaging in fights, considering they're against a team who are the reigning world champions, who've been as a complete roster for years, and they were looking like the more coordinated, sharper team when it came up to these Dragon Baron setups throughout this series. Yeah, Delight, uh, especially Crisp today. I think uh, we can all say here on the global side that we are big fans of this guy, and he really showed up in a big way in the series to really shut down T1. Let's take a look at the 23-minute Baron fight as well, which, uh, again, just choking out the vision, and we're able to start this one on their favor. I mean, this is like where actually game kind of cracked, which is like, it just have to, as soon as it's after this fight is over, I mean, the game is already still one-sided. They're like, oh, like 4,000, 5,000 gold ahead, and the fight today, the T1 selections, every single time, weren't good. Like, it's just the, the, calculated, the calculations be, before they go and fight. Usually, that's a T1 strength, right? Like, before they fight, they know, like, even though, let's say, they are under number or even number, just choosing where the location is, that's the T1 strength. But today, we couldn't really see at all. Yeah, and you even had moments like this where Zeus actually got a double kill on the back end. There was a later fight as well where he was the last man surviving cleaning up. There were still some like individually decent plays from certain T1 members in the fights, but like as a whole, the unit of Final Life was just overbearing in comparison, and it just wasn't enough from T1. Yeah, it was mostly just a team diff across the board. I mean, especially here in Game 3, it was looking pretty close in the beginning, but I think mentally, once you get behind in the mid-game for T1, it's basically over. They had already lost two games, and Humble Life Esports are looking like an incredible juggernaut of a team right now. Let's see who does pick up the POG for Game number 3, as it will, of course, once again be Delight. Yeah, I think it's criminal that they let him get Nautilus three games in a row, but I think, you know, he has had such a good series, series MVP for me for sure. And I just felt like whether he's playing a defensive play like this, where T1 are being uh, attacking them, able to get this kill onto Guma, or whether he's the one setting up and facilitating plays, there's so many moments where he's just making the correct decisions and just locking down multiple members. The value he's getting on this pick is massive. And it's already a strong pick, we know that, and it feels like he just takes it to another level with moments like this. I mean, in this level, like when you're playing on the stage, especially, you just have to be like, it's so, like it's just between a different, a different make. It's just 0 0.1 second. Whoever clicked faster, and today I think the light was just much faster than anyone else. Let's see where the votes do land. As we do have seven out of 12, uh, there was one top vote for the Aatrox Boom Boom. I mean, Doran did 
do a lot in the team fights. And then, of course, Zekka kind of everywhere on the map, I suppose, although he wasn't super crisp with his uh, ability usage, but he was always in the right place at the right time, I think. So I think it's fair that he gets some votes as well. Yeah, I mean, we have had a few votes that were spread, and I think that's just kind of testament to the fact Honor Life Esports as a unit was so formidable this series. I mean, it would have been a little bit better. I would have probably voted for Zeka if he actually just hit more the WE combo. Yeah. He would, have, he, would have, he would have at least like extra five kills, I would say. Just a, you know, yeah. briefly. Honestly, though, that it's Lee in that game, all you do is press E and you're like, my job here is done. And you just yeah. you know, you, you do the cape and you just walk out. Um, let's talk about the predictions for this one because we did have a bunch of T1 voters. We were all incorrect, but also a lot of the Hummel Life Esports voters going for 3-2 or 3-1. Nobody predicting 3-0. Yeah, and you know, obviously in retrospect, you can always look at predictions and it can be very different, but I don't think anyone really had a prediction I would have disagreed with. I feel like people go on either side on the 3-2, I'm like, absolutely fair play. This was just such a massive upset. Not that Hunter Life won, but the fact that it happened in this manner, they just crushed it. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it actually happened 3-0, no one was expecting it. As we see, even the T1 side, it's like just no one would be able to choose the 3-0. So, yeah. I mean, that's... That's massive. I think Hamalai Esports definitely looking really strong coming into this one, but uh, people giving T1 the benefit of the doubt, you know, the roster, they win worlds, but just not able to show up today. Either way, guys, we do have the interview ready to go with Hamalai Esports, the full team, so I'm going to hand it over to Deer for the translation. Thank you very much. This is Deer for the post match interview translation with Hana Life Esports after their clean 3 0 victory against T1. Congratulations! First off, Doran, how does it feel to advance to the upper bracket? We believe that it would be a hard game, a hard match, but I feel like everything that we did in the preparation has paid off. You had an amazing performance with Top Rek'Sai, and in Game 2 you played Jax. And with your opponent blind picking TF in both Games 1 and 2, it revealed how highly they rated him, so did you believe that it was a winnable matchup? I feel like what T1 tries to do, we did predict that they would try to go with the proactive pick top, and I think it definitely went as we expected. It's good to see that confidence. And Doran, you will be the first top laner going for a 4 peed LCK title. And in the upper bracket, you will face your former team, Gen G. With the uh, LCK finals yeah, on the line, what is your resolution? And so, I was very happy with the three-piece title, uh, and now that we're here, um, now that I'm here, I definitely am very eager for that four-piece title, and I will do my best. And next up will be Peanut. Peanut! You know, the predictions by the analyst was neck and neck. And you have advanced to the winner's bracket with after a 3-0 victory against T1. And did you expect it to be a quick victory? Yeah, we definitely didn't expect it to be 3-1. And I believe that the most intense game was game one and since we were able to gain momentum from winning game one we were able to close it out with a clean 3-0 and compared to round one, Hano Life Orange Train has gotten even more solid. How did you prepare against T1? I think we really tried focusing on the basics and the fundamentals. And given that we had a lot of time to prepare, we tried to come up with the best comp that would work for our team. And Pina, did you watch the interview yesterday with Lian? Yeah, I did. Yeah, and so he said he wanted to see you soon. Now that you will meet him in the upper bracket, is there anything you want to say to Lee Hans? Since he said he missed me, uh, I think that's why I was able to climb up this fast. You know, if, if he had done a lot better yesterday, I would be even more scared of him, but you know, it is what it is. What has happened has happened. And Zeka, congrats on the win! This is your first time advancing to the upper bracket. How do you feel? 
I feel like even if we won today, I felt like, you know, it would be a silver scrapes kind of a match. But I'm really happy that we're able to get a 3-0 victory. And specifically in the LCK, you played your first best of five against Baker today. So how was it and how did you prepare for it? I think when it comes to the playoffs, what matters the most is maintaining a good condition and uh, getting prepared for a good draft. And I think everyone in our, our team was feeling great and the draft actually went to our plan. So that's how we ended up getting a great victory today. And we saw Corgi versus Azir match up in both games one and two. And against until today, Faker was on a 22 win streak with Corgi in this matchup. And Corgi has always been favored based on the head to head record. Yeah, I was very scared of the record that Baker holds with Corky, but I think I wanted to overcome my fear and break that record. I knew that that record has to come to an end. And if you defeat Genji in the upper bracket, this will be your first LCK finals. How will you prepare for the next match? When it comes to doing something for the first time, I'm pretty confident. So I hope that you can look forward to a great performance in the next match. Next up, we have Viper. Your performance was on point this entire series. How do you feel? I think everyone worked so hard and it definitely paid off. I'm very happy about the win. And apart from predictions, it looked like there were a lot of openings for bot in the draft. So what was your focus in picking your champion? With the newest patch, I believe that uh, Zeri and Jinx was just something that was very viable and I'm very confident with those champions. And in the upper bracket, you will face your former teammate, Lianz. How would you declare war against Lianz? I won't say much. I will win. Yeah, so that's enough said. And any word for all the fans out there who must be celebrating your victory with you? We, although we have won today, we will not get complacent. We'll make sure that we are ready for the next match. And Delight, what a delightful performance. How does it feel? to get POG in games 2 and 3 to become the main contributor for today's victory. I'm able to uh, do a really good job today and secure a clean 3-0 victory, so I'm really happy about that. And so with Karia's big champion pool, you must have spent a lot of time preparing for the draft. Yeah, I think everything went as we practiced, so I think that's why we were able to have such a smooth match today. And you had an amazing performance with Nautilus in all three games, to the point where the analyst desk was saying, how dare they leave Nautilus open against the light? I think instead of trying to utilize Nautilus as a key pick against T1, I believe that we were able to uh, utilize this at a, as a pick that just goes really well all around with our team composition. So Viper, was the lights Nautilus reliable? Yeah, the laning phase could have been really hard, but the light did such a good job with him. And I believe that we would win all team fights with the light on our side. Now, you have only one match remaining until the finals. You'll be facing your former teammates uh, at Janji. What's your prediction? I believe it won't be an easy match. Uh, we lost against them in both round ones and uh, round one and two, but we'll make sure that we are prepared and make sure that we win. And Peanut, as the team captain, what would you like to say to Janji? 
다 있어도 될까? <웃음> 아, <웃음> 좋습니다. 부드럽지만 Would it be alright if we made it 자, before you guys? 오늘 승리 다시 한번 축하드리고요. 이제 만나러 Congratulations 갑니다. again. 이 기세를 이어서 승자조 경기에서도 좋은 모습 보여주시기를 기대하겠습니다. 인터뷰 고맙습니다. And we hope for a successful round in the, in the remaining playoffs. Uh, that's the end of the interview from Hano Life Esports players and back to the space. Thank you, dear, as always, for that awesome translation. Let's take a look at the match result. 3-0 from Hamale P Sports. Very unexpected, but showing that they are a real contender from the third place in the regular season, they are here to win. Yeah, I feel like that's been the transition with Hamale Life Esports since best of the rest compared to T1 and Gen G2. Oh, actually, in that top three. And now, I think based on this series, looking like the favorite, I could even say, you know, Gen G had a rough series yesterday. I think odds are looking good for Hanwha Life. I felt blue side is pretty OP yesterday. <laughs> and today, red side won. So what's gonna happen? What does it mean? What does what, it mean? What's gonna happen Saturday? Well, I'm gonna be casting on Saturday. So that should be five games. I will be with Aux, so maybe that will change things up. And to be honest, between these two teams, I think it should go five games, right? I think Hanwha Life are amply able to challenge Gen.G. And I think Gen.G coming off a little bit of a struggle versus DK, anything could happen. Are T1 going to make any finals is another question we'll have to ask ourselves. What do you guys think? Uh, I, it's... Like lower finals? I think lower finals will make. I think I, they should, surely they'll, they'll definitely, they'll be DK, right? <laughs> really? I don't yeah. know. Like, we'll see. I mean, oh, it, I mean, the question, like, week ago would have been pretty easier, but right now it got much harder. For yeah. Sure. Things got pretty aware here at the end of today. But, guys, we are done for today. Just three games. Hamalei Fusports with the big win, and they will face off against Gen.G on Saturday. You won't want to miss that. It will be two hours earlier, as it always is on the weekend. So we'll see you then. Have a good night.